Educating, informing, serving. Fact TV, keeping government honest. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, sorry for the delay. As usual, technical issues are confounding us again. Um, it's 6.35, so I'd like to call this meeting to order. We are in the town hall, lower theater. There is a Zoom uh, note uh, on your agenda, so if you go on the town website, you can find it. Also, there's a phone number that you can call in to get at the meeting. Uh, hopefully, everyone has stayed with us while we got going. So that being said, like to... Uh, uh, Go to the agenda. I'll approve the minutes of November 15th. Make a motion. I move that we approve the agenda. Second. Whatever. Minutes. <laughs> minutes. All right. Additions, corrections, deletions, <laughs> omissions. Hearing and seeing none, all those in favor of the minutes would say aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. Most carried. Additions to the agenda for routine administrative matters and depressing matters that will require ratification at the future meeting. I have none. Scott. No, the only thing we were going to talk about is back in April when you passed a resolution for the Cannabis Control Commission. I did send in some information to the state. They had requested uh, that we send it in in the format that I had uh, left copies of at your uh, individual uh, spots there. So it's the same resolution we had passed previously, making it a local commission. They just wanted it in that format. So we could just readopt it and then we'll send it to them with the signature and we can get ourselves registered as a local commission. Nothing has changed. None of our authorities have changed. Hey, so, oh, the only thing we're doing is signing a resolution. We're signing not a to resolution that you passed on April 9th. Yeah, all right. Yes. We just need to sign it. Okay. Yep. That being said, we get started and then while we're moving down the aisle there, we can. Uh, public comment on items not on the agenda. Three minutes per person. Yes. Hi, um, Betsy Thurston with the Bells Falls downtown. I uh, just wanted to update you all on the Snowflake swag. Uh, we had Matt Shanks, Shanks Electric here helping us. Was that yesterday? It was lit last night. Now it's not lit again. Um, he thought maybe after it stopped raining, he would look at it again. He texted me and said he's got some ideas. So he's definitely going to work to fix it for us. So we should have lights for the parade of lights at least. And that is Saturday night at five o'clock. Okay, anyone else? Here you're seeing them. Uh, I guess Gary's got his hand up there. No. <laughs> All right, let's move on to uh, uh, manager report. Yeah, just to give the board a quick update. If you remember, we had advertised for bids and we're working on replacing the recycling and tire shed or, or the tire shed out at the recycling center where we keep the, if you notice, it has a pretty severe lean and it's really becoming unsafe. Um, we thought we'd have to wait until spring to get that project underway. Um, we finally do have somebody, um, we've got three submissions, so we do have a contractor interested. We also now, because of the weather being so mild, have the opportunity now to have our highway guys go in and do the site prep work and spread some millings and actually then be able to do the construction uh, over the winter. So we're going to start that project next week. Um, it looks like, again, we have a pretty good window of weather here, so with that you'll see some activity there. And then probably the first thing you'll see is the old uh, building coming down, so. Yep. It's got the food, that's the food scraps building as well. Yeah, there's food scraps on one side, tires on the other. Yeah, will access be leading, is there a ramp or steps back? It'll Spring. just be at ground level, it'll be an ground level. Right, okay. yeah. One step up. So you won't have to step into it. It'll, it'll, we'll try to spread, we'll, we'll dig out a, found, a small foundation to spread milling so it'll have a nice, Compact surface to work off of. Great. Anything else? No, that's it. Okay, let's move on to the agenda. Number one is the appointment of the Planning Commission. There is a in application in your packet for Remy Walker. 
We have one resignation from the committee, so I'll take a motion. Everybody has seen that. Uh, I make a motion to appoint Remy Walker to the Planning Commission. Second that. You want to read the full motion because it's still a 21-24 for your planning. I move we appoint Remy Walker to the Rockingham Planning Commission starting December 6, 2022, to fill the 2021-2024 three-year planning commission term. The second is still in vogue. Do we have any questions? Hearing seeing none, all those in favor of Remy Walker being appointed, say aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. Motion carries. Next item is to authorize consulting services for, uh, excuse me, Rockingham Meeting House Historic Structures Report update. Mark, well, there's a budget that was uh, presented to us, and there's a full range of people there to uh, speak to that or beat up the questions. So. Yeah, just so that everybody's up to speed. So the, the full report's not done, but I think we're at a point, and especially with some of the budgetary uh, impacts as we go forward, it was worth having this presentation tonight so the board can get a sense of the scope of what's been found and then some potential uh, costs associated with some of those issues to bring the building up to the standard. So I think, um, Walter, did you want to make any other introductions? I'll get it. Sir, is it okay to use this chair? Yep, sure. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm John Lettman, in case any of you don't know me, and I'm the uh, chair of the uh, town, Rockingham Town Historic Preservation Commission. Um, and I will simply say in this situation that um, the Rockingham Meeting House is a subject that every select board gets to hear about. Every select board will always get to hear about <laughs> Uh, it's never going to be entirely off the agenda. Uh, the Rockingham Meeting House belongs to the town of Rockingham. The Rockingham Meeting House is 235 years old, and it is no surprise that uh, it has some fairly significant uh, structural uh, uh, concerns that need to be uh, that need to be addressed. Uh, thanks to a public-private partnership, we've had a uh, uh, very thorough and still ongoing uh, review of the needs of the building uh, done by uh, the firm, a firm with Lisa Papazian, who is here to the, tonight, uh, Bob Neal, who I think is on uh, Zoom, and Laz Skangas, who uh, was not able to be here. I'm going to pass this on to um, uh, Walter Wallace to introduce uh, Lisa, and we'll try to keep this reasonably efficient. Um, Walter? Thank you. Part of the efficiency is, I said no, it wasn't 25 words, but I've only used up half of that. Speak up a conversation. 10 minutes, right? Uh -huh. 10 words. <laughs> Pick up a conversation when we left off back in early August about the need for having a good, a good look in assessing the uh, condition of the meeting house. Uh, we've been having some real challenges, I think, the last number of years in keeping a pace with maintaining, uh, according to our maintenance plan, a building uh, uh, that we just cannot keep up with. And so we've decided uh, with the support of the uh, select board and funding from the Vermont Division for Historic Preservation, Preservation Trust of Vermont, uh, as well as some private uh, donation, as well as uh, some help from the town, uh, from the citizens uh, through uh, the uh, reserve fund for the house. We were able to hire, I think, a top-notch uh, group of people to do an assessment of the building. Mrs. Papazian uh, is no stranger to Rockingham. She is worked with the town over the years on other projects um, of a historic preservation nature. Uh, she's been on lead. I'll introduce her as uh, the speaker and I'll get out of the way here so that she can uh, uh, wallow with uh, what has been discovered here the last several months since we last met. Thank you. Thank you. Is this, a, is this a good place to sit? Yeah. Yeah. Here tonight. Uh, 
Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. 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 Speak up because those things don't pick up that well. So you speak louder. Okay. I don't. I don't pick up that well either. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I couldn't I, hear I, the I'm, previous I'm speaker. Notoriously, yeah, slow, uh, low. <laughs> well, um, I we hello. hello. <laughs> Thank you for having us here. Um, Bob Neal is on Zoom, so he's going to chime in at a certain point. Um, Bob Neal is a structural engineer with Engineering Ventures. Um, I'm Lisa Papazian, Historic Preservation Consultant, leading this team. There's Bob. Hi, Bob. And um, uh, Laz Skangas of Arnold and Skangas Architects is the third piece of this triumvirate. Um, we are the main team that has investigated the building, we are investigating the building. We are, um, this is an ongoing project. We are going to finish up with the full historic structure report in the spring. But um, we've done most of the investigation and observation and poking and prodding and have gathered a huge amount of data and we're still processing it, but we, this is a point where we have um, some conclusions and some costs and some ideas of what the needs are. So I have 45 slides. We're gonna zoom through this. I'm sorry, I know I see your agenda is long. Um, so uh, next slide. <laughs> Um, uh, okay, so I can't see the top, but it, the work done by the team, um, in addition to the three of us, um, that's Bob leaning against the, the, the building there, is also archaeologist uh, Tom Jameson, who is the one who does, did, the, um, did the actual um, excavation for the foundation um, exploration and um, Josh Laughlin, who's a restoration carpenter, local restoration carpenter who helped us by carefully uh, removing boards and then carefully replacing the boards so we could look under things. That's Les Gangus in the middle, poking and prodding. And that's actually Bob Neal in, uh, in the crawl space, which isn't very big. So the things we've done so far are, um, can we go one forward? Sorry, yeah. Um, okay, well, uh, we've done we've done research. Um, I've done a lot of research on it, what has happened in the past 40 years of the building, and I have a spreadsheet of sort of outlining all of that. There've been a lot of reports um, and a lot of assessments done in the past, some work. Um, and that this is the stuff that we've uh, uncovered um, the other products that we've done, we've done a scan of the building, uh, electronic scan of the building, which allowed us to then generate floor plans that reflect actual measurements. Uh, we've done a foundation map. Uh, no back one. Oh, well, okay. Is this back one or is that forward? That was forward one, one, but that's okay. Yeah, that's the foundation map that Bob Neal created, which actually reflects every foundation stone. Um, and how they're not exactly where they're supposed to be. Um, other things we've done are, we did a full structural report, um, plaster assessment, window assessment by uh, Sally Fishburn, who's an expert in both rest restoration, a pew assessment, scope of work, uh, architectural scope of work with the cost estimates. We did a 3D Matterport tour, which is, um, if you've ever tried to buy property nowadays, you can actually virtually um, walk through a building and that's what was done with this kind of 360 degree um, <clears throat> photography. And um, we can go forward, <laughs> sorry. And another one. Um, so some of the, can, I'm gonna, this is the main slide. I'm just gonna go through this. Um, the future slides have photos of all the stuff, but this is the main things that we found. And that's a you know poster child of some of the rock that we found. That's the southwest corner of the building. So there's underneath the clapboards um, by poking the awl, we've discovered a number of soft spots that are covered by paint. Um, there's also deflection that people who have visited the the meeting house can see inside when there's you know sort of a lean to the balcony and cracks opening up 
um, we found very fine and damp soils with, uh, underneath the, in the crawl space, um, so fine that they're particularly susceptible to frost movement. We found lots of deteriorated window sash, even though sash has been, some of it is actually from 1981 and it's still, and it's deteriorated. And there's stuff, you know, things have been done to the sash to restore one or the other. Um, I mean, to address one or the other, but they're still overall in pretty bad shape. Um, a lot of dry and sun damaged woodwork on the interior, very, very thirsty wood and making it very fragile. Um, <clears throat> Plaster is only partially stabilized, not everywhere, uh, for example, and only to a preservation level of treatment. So you can see where they've injected um, adhesives. You can see all the cracks still, um, and not all of it is, is intact. The exterior paint is in pretty bad shape. Um, although from a distance, it looks pretty good. But if you get up close, there's lots of uh, places where the paint is not adhering or there's water getting in. There's other ports, points of water infiltration that we found, holes under slate sheathing right at the roof line, um, whole open uh, seams and flashing, um, un, unpainted bottoms of, of boards that suck up wa uh, water. And um, this should not too surprising, there are a lot of life safety and ADA code violations on this building for, you know, depending on how it's used, but even um, with very light use, the ADA ramp, for example, doesn't meet current, doesn't meet code, and there are no exit signs or uh, emergency lights. Okay, so that's, that's sort of in a nutshell what we found. I'm going to go through these in a little more detail, and I think you can go forward. Yeah, these are just some of the um, images showing what we found. I mean, on the bottom left is an image. While we were excavating around the foundations, it was a downpour and this water did not go anywhere. It was um, we very poor drainage uh, around the building. Okay, we can go forward. Um, this is an example of, of the building scan that was done. Um, it, it, had, it has incredible detail, including um, the roof framing, and it actually shows um, idiosyncrasies in the framing of where things have dropped, where things are um, out, of, out of whack. Go to the next one. Um, and from these, uh, Las Gangas developed um, floor plans and elevations. And you know, to those floor plans, he then went in and started adding pew numbers. And you can't, it's hard to tell, but like even uh, where the benches are and where the supports under those benches are and where they're not, which is another problem. Um, next slide. That's an example of the elevations that Laz developed. Um, next slide. Um, yeah, and this is the, the 3D tour that I was mentioning. It's, a, it's actually a, a, an on, online of now and um, I, that, actually, that link should work, but we can send it around as well and share it. And it's very cool. You get to walk through the building uh, virtually and areas where you don't actually, you can't walk through, he, like in the attic, um, he did take a number of uh, 360 degree views. So there are still images, but you can turn around sort of and see everything. Um, next one. And again, the archaeology, um, that map shows in red what we just did in terms of new test pits. And the map itself was test pits that were done in 1991 prior to another um, oh, bit of work. So this sets the stage for understanding what kind of archaeology is going to be required in the future, especially if we're doing major foundation work. Next slide. Um, so this is the structural report, and um, I'm going to let Bob, can you unmute yourself? Do you want to, can you see these? Yes, I can. Um, so, uh, yeah, this is uh, existing conditions. Um, we're, these are pretty consistent as we worked around the building um, with the test bits. 
and uh, basically there's uh, there's granite um, 14 uh, as 14 to 18 inches deep, um, roughly averaging around 16 inches, and then there's about 10 inches of uh, of stone rubble below that, and uh, and then that sits on native material, and um, that's that's pretty much it. Um, we did do some soil test testing. We had sieve analyses taken of the material so that we could understand uh, the makeup of the soil, um, and uh, it's uh, as as suspected, it's got a lot of silt and uh, and some clay in it, and uh, so therefore, very frost susceptible, and uh, so we we think a lot of the movement of these stones is because of um, frost heaving and um, common, combination of frost heaving and settling. Next, next slide. So the uh, the framing systems uh, we were able to get in in uh, in a couple places to be able to. See, there's a total of four different places where we could see uh, what was going on with the uh, with the wood framing. Um, we took some moisture content readings throughout um, and found that the worst cases really were the sills, uh, but there are also some fairly high moisture contents in the in the floor framing. Uh, there's some areas that we couldn't get to where you could actually see the uh, the soil was in contact. With the wood, and so we have some some concerns about what the uh, the, the condition of the of the timbers are in those areas, and um, so the the the, uh, the material in there, the uh, the soil uh, is is moist and damp. If you grab it, you can feel that it's uh, it's got a fairly high moisture content in there. Um, and probably what's been keeping things in as good shape as possible is there's a fair amount of air moving through there because of the cracks between the stones. Next slide. The, uh, uh, one of the things that um, has been going on um, that was noticed before we got here was some deflection in the balcony and I, and my understanding is that some of the windows have uh, broken over the years as well, uh, most likely due to that exterior wall moving. Um, some frost heating there. The, the other thing that I think is going on here, um, you know, it sort of looks like the exterior wall is has dropped. Um, and it may be that uh, the interior has actually heaved a little bit. If anybody's been in this building in the winter, I got to imagine that uh, in uh, late January, it's, um, it's pretty cold and there's no snow over the ground inside. So frost penetration underneath the interior footings can be quite severe. And th this, this sketch here shows that it's, it's hard to see at the scale, but um, that straight line across there is, um, is horizontal. And both uh, the, the left and the right side of that shows us a substantial difference in the elevation of the interior versus the exterior. And it looks to me like the interior footings have actually raised a little bit. Next slide. Uh, so we're, we're able to um, uh, do some analysis of the existing um, floor system at the first floor. Uh, there, there's kind of a combination. There are a few areas uh, where we would um, propose some reinforcing to bring up to current codes. Some other areas, actually, the native framing was um, was in, was in pretty good shape. Mostly the the aisles where um, the where people would go in and out. Um, would would need some work, uh, and again, we do have some concerns about the integrity and the, the rot and some of the framing. Uh, the balcony, we were able to uh, see some isolated areas, and we were seeing the balcony at this point um, for a, a fairly light, limited use could be okay. And uh, the roof framing has had some work done on it in the past. You can see in the picture on the bottom left that. 
in the 90s, there was some support added to the purlins. And so at this point, we are not suggesting any remedial work to the roof framing. Next, next slide. So um, we're starting to look at, at treatment elements, uh, options, and um, we, we think that um, based on the movement of the building and the movement of the stones, that um, we, we think it's imperative that we address the uh, potential for frost movement in the building. Um, and you can see some of the, some of these interior cross space shots of uh, the foundations moving around quite considerably. Next. Next question. So the, uh, the, the first option that we're considering um, is a new foundation uh, under the existing. And um, the, uh, the one thing to realize about this is that we would propose removing the stones, uh, numbering them, keeping them um, in, in order and resetting them on a new concrete foundation that goes down to frost step. And this, this would involve, uh, it's a fairly, um, fairly intense operation, I think, to get in and uh, lift the building. Um, certainly not unheard of uh, for a building of this size. And li by lifting it, we would gain access to the underside to be able to see what the condition of the framing is, reinforce things, repair things, uh, replace the interior footings and replace the exterior footings um, with the stones put back in place and set the building back down on it. Next slide. Um, we, we jumped there. Um, the, the, uh, the other option uh, that we're looking at um, was a shallow frost protected foundation and this could be done also by lifting the building all up at once and then resetting it. Um, and, um, but it's possible that we might be able to do a more gentle approach to this by excavating um, and putting a shallow foundation, not digging all the way down to five feet, using insulation to, um, uh, to provide the frost protection. Uh, I do have some concerns about this option. Um, mostly, um, uh, I'm concerned that getting in and getting access to the interior footings would be difficult. Uh, it does not allow you, unless you jack up the whole building, um, it does not allow you to get access to the, uh, <clears throat> to the timbers to be able to inspect things. And ironically, it, it may end up requiring more um, excavation of the exterior because we've got to put the footing drain out of ways. Um, um, so uh, there, there's some pluses and minuses. Um, next. Yes. Next slide. There we go. Um, oh yeah. So I, I, what I said here, option one is the preferred solution. Um, next. I think that's it. Okay. We're going okay. I, I should say that on the top of these slides, there there were prices for the two yeah. options, which you can't really see. And I will just say that option one is $516,375 as current estimate. And the option two, $295,958. Although there's some question about whether that is realistic and whether more that might actually end up being more because of the difficulty of, of the second option, which is, so I don't know, I don't know if there's, that's gonna happen again with a couple other slides. I can just tell you what the numbers are. They're kind of hidden under the- well, We could move the, um, the, bar. the window to the bottom. Okay, yeah, we know what our names are already. <clears throat> Yeah, sorry, I, I, I didn't mean to gloss, gloss over the, uh, the cost numbers. No, it's okay. <laughs> um, well, then, thanks, Bob. I, but the, then in terms of the, the next um, section is about ex exterior trim, siding, and paint. That's the next um, big, biggest ticket item after the, after the other. And these are just some of the uh, conditions. Wanna, 
go to the next one. We can just run through the next three. Looking, this, this is where um, flashing is not intact. Um, next one. Again, uh, paint problems and, and actual rot under the paint and some of the window heads. Next slide. This is that, uh, again, better, better pictures of that southwest corner, which it looked okay. And you just poke it in, the rod kept going. So we opened it up, and this is what we found. Um, that's a picture of the condition of the front doors and um, the southwest corner. Uh, the cornice is kind of coming off or loosening up. So, in terms of restoring, we are proposing restoring all the exterior trim and siding and proper paint job. And that's, you know, about 15% of clabberts would be replaced in kind um, with hand plane clabberts. Uh, everything would be replaced in kind um, that needed to be. There are a couple of specific areas that Les has particularly called out here. Um, but in general, this also adds metal handrails, which are required at some of the door, the entry, uh, the door, the doors um, for code. But it's um, a lot of it is in the paint and the and the prep, the proper prep for that. Um, and uh, three coats, two coats, one primer, two finish. We can move forward. <laughs> Um, and on the on the roof, I mean the roof's okay for the most part, but there are some issues. Um, there are some issues where it intersects with the building itself, where there's drainage issues. There's and the, the two on the right show it's hard to see, but there are those are gaps in the um, the end of the of the um, roof, so there's actual opportunity for water to potentially get in. Next slide. So um, those roof repairs and, and um, making re refinishing the uh, <clears throat> the uh, the flashing is fifteen thousand six hundred seventy. Um, next slide. We had a window assessment uh, done. Laz also looked at all the windows, as did I. But Sally Fishburn, who's a window restorer, uh, did a report. <clears throat> Um, this is the, you know, what she found is a range of conditions, basically eight windows are from 1981 when they were replaced, the reproduction windows. Um, two of those have recently been fully restored, um, but all the others are in a very states of um, need. Go ahead, the next one. Um, Again, the conditions of the windows vary, but one of the biggest issues, if you particularly see on the right, um, there's practically nothing left of the outside muntins. And so it's literally worn away. The wood is worn away and there's not, not enough to um, reglaze to and to secure um, paint and, or, and the glass. So it puts it all at risk to just keep sort of um, touching it up. Um, and even on, on the left, that's that's one of the re, re, reproduction sashes, and it's, it, its paint is failing. On the interior, there's an awful lot of places where their paint is failing and, and um, UV de degradation and just drying out wood have, have caused a number of other problems. So basically, to get paints to adhere, um, the you have to create lasting seals, fully restore the sash. Um, it really, all the glazing needs to be replaced. And so the sashes need to come out, glass should be removed and reglazed. And, and that's also required to build up the wood on the outside by um, Dutchman, you know, piecing in additional wood. But ultimately that's what we're rec recommending because restoration, is possible. Um, there's a great example of the two sashes that are that were done recently, and it preserves this very significant original fabric, which is most of the windows, and that's pretty unusual. Um, reproduction would give you, um, you know, a cleaner look. Not actually that much more money, but it you'd lose an eno an enormous amount of the integrity of the property. Next one. 
So um, the cost to do what we're suggesting, full restoration of the windows is 186,900, another big ticket item there. Um, but everything would get reinstalled um, and fully painted properly. As I said, the number on the bottom to repro reproduce the windows, um, 203,490. Next one. Um, ADA access. Uh, Laz is, as I said, the, the current ramp does not meet current code and on the outside and especially the ramp on the inside does not meet code. And then even if it did, once you got in, someone, especially in a wheelchair, would have no place to go. And they, you know, you can't have an event with having someone stick, you know, stuck in the aisle. So Laz created another plan where the ramp has to be longer because it's too steep right now. So we took it to the side because if you went straight out, it would come uh, be in front of the front of the building. So off to the side with steps um, coming straight out. And then on the inside, the ramp has to be longer, which would mean you'd have to re remove the door that's there and um, <clears throat> probably not hang it on the wall so it couldn't ever possibly be closed. But, um, but at any rate, you wouldn't lose anything. And then you, you would modify one pew, possibly remove a door and a panel and keep it on site. But uh, it would allow uh, someone in a wheelchair to come in, get into the aisle, and get into a pew where they could um, be seated. And that's the price up top. So Sally also did a plaster assessment. Um, there have been, in 2001, um, Lori Brennan did a whole uh, proposal for full plaster restoration, um, which wasn't done. Um, pieces of it have been done, but not restoration. Preservation level bits of plaster um, stabilization have happened. Um, some was done in 2011, and another um, uh, set of, work was done in 2020, I mean, 2020. Um, and so the total of 58% has been conserved, but um, yeah, sorry, um, but, but only to preservation level, which means you can still see the cracks, you can still see um, pieces that are missing. You can still see the example on the right, you can barely see it, but it's a, a sort of most fun example of graffiti all of the graffiti on the walls, historic, um, have all been coated once with um, whitewash, probably in 1906 when this, the building was restored. So they're they're sort of they're ghostly. But um, the other thing um, we can go to the next slide. Sorry. Um, for the, the there are pieces that are still delaminating and coming down. On the far right, the picture actually shows um, on the left the bay of uh, what you're looking at is in the attic and we're looking at the plaster keys on the ceiling. That part has been restored and there are dark spots you can see which were, which is actually the, um, the uh, adhesives that were in injected. But that's the edge of the gallery in the main ceiling, the part on the right um, was never done. So that section that is the two-story section has never been done. Um, yeah, and the, invect, uh, the preservation level has left the injection um, holes and sites very visible. Um, and what, what Sally recommends is standard plaster rest, full restoration includes not only re-adhering the plaster back to the lab, but, but also filling the holes and then covering them feathering it uh, so that it's prepared for uh, refinishing. And she would suggest um, whitewash, another whitewash treatment. Although avoiding either all the graffiti or the most significant there, that's, that's an area of, that needs to be further discussed, I think, in terms of how to treat that. And there, there are options and different ways of doing it. You can go to the next one. These are some of the costs though for just the preservation level, which is what has been done to, to date, would be $80,000. Um, 
for full restoration of that same um, plaster would be 93,000. That's what we're recommending. And again, to, um, in addition to do the um, bring the, the already conserved plaster up to a restoration level, you know, the 24,000 and then the coatings um, would be 13 or 18, depending on when it was done. There might be additional setup if it was done later. Okay. Um, yeah, briefly, I did a Pew assessment of the pews in the building. They were done extensively by Chris Cole in 2005. Very little has changed. Um, he, much of the stuff he recommended has not been done. Um, and so uh, there are some small places where um, repairs need. There's some broken but the areas, but the most, um, like you can see where a railing is pulling out of uh, the uh, intersecting railing there and their cracks. Um, but the, the picture at the top is something that is of concern to me, which was that there are many benches that are under supported. I mean, there's, there's no, you can, you can see there's no support under that bench, under that L-shaped bench, except far in the corner. So there's a number of places where that is the case. It's a concern. Um, all of the wood is fairly dry, like much of the interior. So cleaning and lightly sanding and just re-moisturizing re it with a wax finish um, on the first floor would be 60,566 and second floor 39,193. Um, so basically 100,000 to do both floors. Okay, the next one. Um, so to continue in terms of the interior treatment, um, the conditions we find, they're mixed conditions, areas that have paint, um, it's a sort of light thin wash on the woodwork. Other areas where it's natural are very dry, worn, um, stained and vulnerable on the, especially the flooring. Um, there's some, some small pieces of broken areas. Um, so the treatment would be to re clean, lightly sand, prep and repaint the painted woodwork that price is uh, 47, 479, and then the flooring to lightly sand and seal it with an oil-based sealer, not refinishing it, like not re-sanding, like we think of refinishing the floor, just lightly um, to really give it um, the moisture it needs to protect itself, to be protected. So those prices are below on the first floor and the second floor. We don't have an estimate on the repair, but it's not going to be a big number. That's okay, you can keep going. Then the other issue that was we looked at or that Laz looked at is the um, code issues. And there's plenty. Um, so the, as you can imagine, life safety building code current is, um, is, you know, pretty, requires quite a lot for assembly use. So um, the minimum construction requirements are without a sprinkler system, um, assembly use with 300 people or less, but never. But you can't um, on the second floor. But that's that's just capacity. That doesn't include all the other issues, which are like means of egress. So the doors do not meet code um, in terms of means of egress. They shall not be less than 32 inches, and that's. I'm not going to read all of this, but the door hardware, there's issues. It there's obviously no panic hardware. The doors actually swing in. Um, and to change a door swing is not that big a deal on many historic buildings, but on this one, it's a big deal. It changes the entire look of the door, the depth that you see, um, and, the, and the hardware is original. Next one. Oh. The, yeah, the, the, the exits are also, you're not allowed to have a door open onto a step or two steps in this case, and that's what we have. And we would have to you know, build up in front of the east door, not just the west door where there's a ramp and the front door. Um, whoops, let's go back one. And again, the stairs are to the upstairs, even if we could use it lightly um, for light use, the stairs, and the doors at the top of those stairs are um, real problematic. And in terms of um, the 
if, if you've ever gone up those stairs, you know that a regular foot doesn't even fit on the treads. It's, it's particularly um, dangerous. And the handrail requirements, not even close. And the door swing literally opens right onto a step from the inside. So on so many fronts, a lot would have to happen to alter all of that um, to allow the upstairs to be used, which doesn't seem like a good trade-off, really. Um, so next one. We feel like the minimum that is definitely necessary to um, bolster the, the use that is happening now is um, to add ex interior exit signs and some emergency lighting. There's, there's limited electricity at the site that currently operates a security um, alarm system. Um, so that could be added. Now, a full detection alarm and communication fire detection system could be added. And, but it might, if, if the occupancy was kept low, it might not be needed. Um, and so we're planning a, com uh, a conversation with the code officials, the Division for Historic Preservation, and uh, our team to all sort of talk through some of these issues on site. It obviously brings up a lot of conversations that need to, that the building owners, you guys need to think about in terms of the future use. Um, so just sort of finally, finally um, a couple things. You know well that the Rockingham Meeting House is a National Historic Landmark. It is because it's the oldest surviving public building in Vermont, but its level of integrity, both in, in its design um, as a second um, generation meeting house and its materials, its remaining uh, original fabric, that's what's exceptional about it. And that's what it gives it its status and its significance is, it, is that integrity. So you have to balance the preservation of that, the integrity to all the fabric with its continued use and meeting code. Too much change in the form of rehabbing it to meet those assembly codes in order to have events, bigger events. Um, it really can um, undermine your ability to raise the money for that because uh, you know, its importance is it's, it's not changing. That, I'm not saying that very well, but um, I think we get you. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, um, what we're proposing is preservation and restoration of historic fabric, especially in order to protect that fabric and protect any investment that you make in the building. So next slide. There are two more. Um, in the past, interventions have added like added things like the ramp, but haven't taken anything away. Um, underlying, you know, original design problems like roof um, inadequacy have been um, addressed by adding um, roof supports without taking, again, without taking anything away. And that, I mean, although it's dramatic, the foundation we're proposing also doesn't take anything away. It puts a new foundation underneath and places the stones back on it. Um, but it would protect all the other potential restoration. Um, in the past, that restoration has been subject to continued movement and um, loss. So the last slide is one more, I think. Yeah, so we're proposing, no, sorry. The restoration of the windows, the restoration of the plaster, light cleaning and conditioning of interior woodwork, um, sistering and amplifying the first floor framing, um, to continue to use it um, successfully on the downstairs. And then in-kind repair of the, you know, restoration of the exterior trim and clapboards, and then the foundation work. We, we suggest the full um, lifting the building so that you can really address the underneath, under what's underneath. We don't recommend replacement of the plaster or replacement of the windows for the reasons I've already talked about. So, Thank you. Sorry if that went over, but um, and thanks for your attention. Appreciate it. And I have, you have questions. Just, um, will we get a copy of that slideshow? Yeah, I, I mean, yeah. Um, so if you put it on the website and um, 
Yeah. He says there's see it may have been there a sequence of which operations should happen first, second, or third. You know, honestly, we we literally just got some of these numbers and I haven't really fully thought about it. I think the next order, the first thing that would need to happen is you wouldn't put any money into the building until you lifted it. Right. And so that would be the first thing that would happen is archaeology prior prior to that project. Um, still waiting to hear from the state about what the scope of that archaeology might be, um, partly based on what they found the last time, which wasn't much. So, but they suggest that that be done, then the foundation, then I would, the foundation work. Um, and then, you know, that to lift the building, you have to take out the windows to protect them anyway. So that can happen together. A quick question for Walter. What uses, I mean, I, I now, now we have docents and tourists come in and walk around the place. We have a select board meeting there once a year. What what other uses are planned? Historically, uh, there have been weddings, there have been memorial services, celebrations, of riots, there have been music events. Uh, the most uh, uh, common music event might be something like uh, uh, two years ago we had third Sundays at three music event, the fundraiser, mm -hmm. where we had uh, volunteer musicians come in, string quartet, bell ringers from Saxons River, etc. They would perform for an hour starting at three, draw crowds of anywhere between 35 and 50 people uh, for, you know, for donation toward the upkeep of the building. We have had, uh, well, for about 20 years, there was an annual event there uh, tied in with the roots on the river that uh, could draw upwards of 200 or more people into the building uh, for a one-day event, typically in the morning and uh, to the later part of the afternoon. Um, I will say, and I just looked over some of the use uh, uh, the usage over the last uh, 12 years, uh, for which we have records, and it has not been used much since COVID, where it's still in this kind of rebuilding stage of people becoming aware that it is available and that people would want to come and use. Although I will say that we have had some people coming in to scope out the place uh, for a wedding and uh, you never hear back from them. And I think that's in some measure because of the condition of the building. Few, fewer than 300 people at all these events. Many, people. much fewer. Yeah, much fewer. Yes. Okay. Uh, now, the weddings could be anywhere between 25 and upwards of 100 people. I'd say that from what I've experienced uh, this past year, I think we had two weddings there, uh, and uh, they drew between 50 and 80 people. I think it was about 50 people. Thank you. I mean, I think it all. Anything over 49 is assembly use. I believe that's not, not here to back me up on that, but I think that's the case. Yeah. So I think one of the goals of that meeting that we're talking about having is the code officials and the historic preservation folks is to try to figure out what compromises could be made so that you might, uh, might be allowed to have more than 49 an assembly use without too much alteration of the building. I, I might add to that that the, uh, Lisa mentioned that there is really probably no fix that preserves the integrity of the building to the fact that ingress and egress to the balcony is very difficult. Right. Um, so no matter what you're talking about, you're talking about people sitting in general on the lower in the lower floor of the building uh, with the possibility that if you had a wedding photographer or somebody who was going to be up there. The other thing I think of is sometimes at the annual pilgrimage with that brass choir up there. Mm -hmm. But it, it, the limit, the use of the balcony for anything like that would be extremely limited. And there's really no way around the fact that that will continue. And just to build on that, uh, uh, when we did have the plaster uh, falling issues in the East Isle back in 2019, um, it was decided and the balcony is closed off for the visitors to so even um, uh, 
uh, you know, the visitation is only on the first level. Everything else is roped off. So we don't regularly stop around up there because the framing up there, you can feel it if you walk, you can feel the movement up there. You know that it's really, really stress and strain on the plaster work on the uh, ceilings below. Anyone have any other further questions? I know one. First of all, that was an excellent presentation. It's so thorough. Thank you. It's hard to the class, though. But um, that building is so important to our community. So that's why I was here tonight. And I don't know, we're going to have to find some people that make big donations to keep that building. So the um, statistic being the oldest and it's a foundation of our community. So. To find people to help us be quartered. Thank you. If, if I may? Yeah, go ahead. Just picking up on uh, Annette's point, uh, and it is the elephant that's in the room. Uh, uh, this is a pretty extraordinary cost to talk about. And it's a cost that uh, um, the cost of the town stewarding this property for just not the town for the region but for the country it is a national historic landmark the national park service does have a grant program to support the preservation so that the larger community of the nation helps us can help us support the preservation work that needs to be done here i think it's already been reported that uh, we do have a congressionally directed spending request that's been approved that has gone through that's now sitting don't know if it's been funded. It's through Bernie Sanders' office. It is for a three hundred and sixty thousand dollar Save America Treasures grant program. The Save America Treasures grant program was started back in the nineteen nineties, specifically to help save a national historic landmark such as this. You have to be a national historic landmark. We have to have that level of significance, which is our building. Now, the Save America Treasures Grant program actually has a ceiling of up to $750,000. Um, we've already had conversations about the strategy, about how best to approach. In fact, that's what generated the assessment and what will eventually end up with the Historic Structures Report that, uh, would, uh, that is the standard for a Save America Treasures approach. It is, however, a dollar for dollar match. And if we're talking about a $750,000 ask from a grant, which has the support of the congressional delegation in Washington, it does have the support uh, from the Preservation Trust and from the Vermont Division for Historic Preservation. It certainly has the support, I believe, uh, within the spirit of the town. We do have to raise other funds. I think that there will be uh, a very strong effort. In fact, uh, not that there will be, there needs to be a strong effort to be able to come up with that funding to be able to match that. If we are to preserve and conserve this for our grandchildren and our great grandchildren, I think that one of the points that's come out in this presentation is that there's some very severe issues that the hands been kicked down the road, unfortunately, because it is so expensive to do this kind of preservation work. But I think we're at a point where we need to be able to creatively address the need to stabilize from the ground up the foundation work so that we don't, so the town doesn't end up spending. funds to repair something cosmetically when the foundation is insecure that rather than uh, spend money to throw more paint on rotting wood that the rotting wood is taken care of so thank you for your thank you there yeah. so um uh well it uh, would be the, the best thing to uh, to do everything in one project will the final report Indicate and say if it had to be spread out over years, like you know, um, half million dollar foundation first, like a recommended sequence, 
and which things would be in jeopardy of not being uh, restorable if they went too too long, that sort of thing. Yeah, uh, right. honestly, we haven't gotten there yet, but yes, so that is definitely the intention. Who else? Okay, so now let's uh, thank you folks for coming in. Thank you. It's informative. Thank you for thank you. Is thank that you very website, much. is that link accessible? The Matterport one? Yeah, yeah through whose office? The Matterport will we'll, we'll, we'll be linked up there. It'd be interesting just to look at it. Absolutely. Than we'll that make sure time. that that this PowerPoint presentation and that link for the Matterport will be uh, online. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I'll do that first thing. I think that link actually works. <laughs> no. I put it down. No, okay. Good. Send us, um, send us. I see Don Lisa. Okay. Go ahead. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Bob. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Bob. Thank you. All right. I will uh, send everyone a link. All right. Let's move on to the next item, which is the authorized consulting um, services contract for hydroelectric property. Uh, they were forming your packet commission signed by the board. Uh, just by way of a little. Background for the board and Paul's here, and maybe he can elaborate. Um, we're in the beginning stages of looking at our next five year tax stabilization renewal process. Um, this particular uh, valuation process is important to that discussion with the hydro. Um, it's a very specialized type of uh, work, as you can imagine, because not everybody sits on a river with a hydroelectric dam. So it's something that's very uh, specialized and, and uh, this firm has been used by this board in the past and has continued to be sort of the, the leading resource for us in, in terms of foundational work that we'll need as we approach a discussion with the hydro and their new owners and sense of where we're gonna be as we go forward. So. It's sort of the first stage in a long conversation we'll have, not only with them, but also through the listers. And um, this will provide some of that detail that we'll need as we sit down and start serious negotiations about how we might come to an agreement. Paul, is there anything else you want to jump in and throw into that mix? Are you basically outlined what it is? Uh, what we're doing, uh, a little history, and I'll start with a very simple thing. I think several months ago, I, maybe uh, six months, one of your members came to our office uh, and sat down and very calmly asked us, uh, what do you do? And quite honestly, the, the member is smiling. Uh, <laughs> One of the things that's interesting one that our answer was, well, we're really not sure. So we started a value engineering and analysis program for the department. We have changed the entire operations of what you would call the listers. So part of that value analysis was that we really didn't know how secure our grand list was. And that is kind of a scary thing to say because our numbers were correct, as you know, for years. But so we started what is called a, a data verification study. And we started, and you'll see our poor little guys running around. We started looking at 300 properties that are residential and commercial. And we had to include the power station. And that was one of the more difficult because since the last appraisal, items have been moved. So we didn't know whose property was where. And they're moved, I don't want to say in the darkness of night, but they're moved whenever the power company has a need to move something. And you've noticed transformers have come and gone. There one are here, one's there, and move. Where is it? So that was the reason to reestablish the value of this plant. Number one, there is a possibility that we will be demanded to do a reappraisal of the whole town. There are four ways to do that, and we need to decide which way we will do it. The security of our data is the key to that. 
So right now we've engaged Mr. Sansusi's company to redo the evaluation, let's say update the evaluation of that plant. That's compounded by the current drive to create uh, green energy and get rid of coal burning plants, et cetera. So this plant's actual operations could make a major change, which will affect its value. We do not know exactly how that's going to play out. But we want to be doggone sure we know where everything is and how much it's worth when that happens so we can do this. The town manager has been really helpful with this. We have a plan uh, to look at it. And the plan is what you need. We'll get that for you. And by the time that junction hits us, we think we can probably make a decision to move forward with the select board and the manager to accomplish a reasonable and, and fair analysis of how much that might be worth for both the town and for the owner of the plant. That's where we are today. We're up to date. We, we toured the entire plant yesterday. We were down there six hours, crawling around underneath it, in it, over it, and out to all the transformer yards. <laughs> When you go see it, you're going to see a transformer yard, but there are actually four owners of that transformer. And the values depend on whose it is, run from the hundreds of thousands of dollars to more. So we need to know who to send the bill to. And they moved. So that's the purpose. That's where we are. And I think that we've that by virtue of this little program that we first started with the questions, we have changed the outlook of the of this solicitor's office from a clerical uh, office to a service office. And by that we mean we are now trying to service every department in this town and all the citizens. So the invitation is, if you have a question, come see us. It will be instantly recorded on a computer database and it will be tracked there. So I can walk into the office tonight, push the button and tell you what every one of our listeners has said, to whom, what he said and where it stands. And that's something we never could do before. We just have to wait for somebody on vacation to come home. So everything is now online in our office. It is not public, so don't to find it on your website. And the reason for that is some of the conversations involve financial and personal data that we are not allowed to release. So you're not, we're not insulting you. <laughs> we're protecting you. That's what I got. All right, uh, questions. Yeah, so that dam is being sold yet again. To what? what is? The dam, the power dam. I hear it being sold yet again now to a to Canadian company. How is, um, do you know what was the time frame on that and how that's going to, it's going to have any impact at all? Yes, I do. The time frame has occurred. The paperwork has not been processed. It will be processed within the next 60 days. The sale was made from what you know as Great River Hydro. Is, it is going to remain that name. We will not change. But the owner is Quebec Hydro. Mm -hmm. So it was a $2 billion deal for the 13 dams I, I read. Yeah. And the price per hour facility, the facility in town, will that affect its appraised or its assessed value? I mean, if they paid twice as much as Quebec Hydro, Quebec paid for it X years ago, will that enter into the calculations of its worth to the town? Yes is no. We don't value it on the sell price. We use sell prices as comparisons, but we're mandated to write on the on the income basis. So what change occurs in the way it is used will affect us. And just for the number two million, there's a question, was it Canadian dollars or American was the first <laughs> one. And the second question is, what did they buy? And they bought more than the Connecticut River. So that price 
yeah. is a little bit deceptive because it, it is not just this plant. Oh, I know it's 13. What I read it's, here, the, it's yeah. literally everything that Quebec Hydro bought, and the name of the company is going to remain. But Quebec Hydro is a subsidiary of, I mean, Great River is a subsidiary of, of Quebec Hydro. So the value of the energy it produces, yes, we can we can tax on that basis. That's exactly what we do. We tax on the amount of energy they sell. That's the first. We measure it three ways, but that is the mandated method that must be employed, checked by the others. And then we have the freedom to exercise some limited judgment as to, and that's why we need to know exactly what's there. If we see a deficit that isn't covered by the income approach, we can then adjust it. Then they, they can easily challenge any adjustments. We don't make casual adjustments. So we're pretty confident, and I've been dealing with Dan Susi on this subject for about six months now. And uh, he, he's pretty well got his feet on the ground. We've got all the data we need. We should get a, a tentative data next month, this, this month. So we're in good shape and we're pretty happy. Okay, anyone else? Hearing none, I'd like a motion to approve the, uh, the, the services contract for Kansas and Associates assigned by the software. So can I have a motion? I move to approve the um, what's it called? Services yeah. front contract. Services contract yeah. With Sanzuzi. Here, second. The second. Motion to remain seconded to approve the contract with Santuzzi for uh, the service contract. Any further concerns, questions? <coughs> yes. Is, is there a, a ultimate amount that this contract is for? I noticed the hourly rates and all that stuff. Is it, did I miss that? Or is there, is there a fixed yeah, amount? Mm -hmm. There's a base contract. Yeah, it's it's not to receive. Right, it's a $40,000 contract. Yeah. The hourly rates are like if they need to come and do some work. Right. Okay, it's $40,000. All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 All those opposed nay. Come on for signatures. Now let's go this way. Let's make it the last one. Hey, right. yeah. Uh, it's like wall greens up with the outstanding resource water presentation. I am. Um, Are you still awake? I was uh, <laughs> nodding there a while ago, but um, yeah. So thanks for having us tonight. Um, what we're proposing is going to cost nothing, and you all don't have to do anything. So I figure <laughs> this is deal. a good happy like thing to be presenting. The. Um, Conservation Commission is interested in putting in an uh, application for three different sites in Rockingham for out the can for the um, the title, but the designation, the honor of being have, having outstanding resource waters in town, and um, it's kind of a lengthy process, but. Um, in my role on the Conservation Commission. I'm glad to do it. It might take a little while. We just wanted to let you all know right at the get-go, um, details are still being worked out. There's a lot to do, but we wanted to have you in at the very beginning so you wouldn't have any confusion or feel like we're going over your heads or anything. Um, it's a, kind of a set process. I think Margo's going to talk you through those steps. She's got some photos and a little more of the detail. But um, it really, this is a collaboration between the Conservation Commission, private citizens, and um, with the support of Wyndham Regional Commission. So it's a really nice thing that way. And we're going to reach out to partners who also are concerned and interested about these um, these wonderful, amazing water resources that we have in our town. So Margo, I think that's what I have to say. Would you take over? Um, 
Oh God, neighbor too, why not? <laughs> it's so good to stand up for a minute, I have to say. Yeah, we're good to stand. Um, so I'm excited to be able to share a little bit of information with you all tonight about Outstanding Resource Waters. Um, just to clarify, so I am here representing um, as support for uh, the Rockingham Conservation Commission and the citizens um, that are part of the committee um, from Wyndham Regional Commission are the Natural Resources and Energy uh, Planner there. But I also just for full exposure, uh, you know, I am a resident of Rockingham, so on that level too, I am very excited and um, interested in this topic. So because this is a PDF, Gary, you're going to have to scroll, I think, instead of hit the next button. So if you could go next. <laughs> oh, got it. That was more than a scroll. So um, Outstanding Resource Waters is a, a federal designation, so all 50 states have it. Um, here in Vermont, Vermont Act 67 is what um, sort of established and made the rulings for what outstanding resource waters in Vermont looks like. It does look different in different states, so what applies here in Vermont might not apply in another state. But it is a river's policy, and you can see here, provides protection to rivers that have exceptional natural, cultural, recreational, or scenic values. And uh, we do have one example here in Wyndham County that is already designated an outstanding resource water, and that's Pikes Falls in Jamaica. So next. So outstanding resource waters, um, why do it? So the, the, it is an anti-degradation law. So basically it looks at an existing site, where is it currently? And says, we wanna preserve this amazing resource at the level that it is today. So it's not saying it has to be restored back to a certain level. It's not saying it has to, um, you know, anything has to be done to it. But what it does is protect it into the future so that we can keep those cultural or scenic or um, aquatic, you know, biological resources, whatever it's nominated for, protected. So, for example, if a stream alteration permit was to be applied for in the stretch of uh, outstanding resource waters, it would just say that it couldn't, it's not that it can't happen, it's just that it would be another layer to look at saying what will, what's being proposed and will it affect negatively this, this stretch of water. So next slide. So there are three potential Rockingham um, Outstanding Resource Water sites. These sites have all been identified in um, the Tactical Basin Plan, which there are tactical basin plans that cover the whole state of Vermont. We in Rockingham are covered under uh, base, Tactical Basin Plan 11 13, which is the West Williams and Saxons River and associated tributaries that come directly into the Connecticut River. So these are the three sites. You can see that there's the Williams River scenic area, the, uh, which is around Brockaway Mills, Herrick's Cove, and a site that we're referring to as Great Falls, which is, um, you'll see, and I'll show you more detail in a second. So we'll go to the next slide here. So there are different categories that each site can be nominated for. So we went through with the um, Mott Department of Mott DEC, Environmental <laughs> Conservation, and we looked at each of the three sites and said, what are, the, what are the values that come up for each of these sites? So for example, Herrick's Cove, there's water quality classification, um, maining habitat for threatened or endangered plants or animals, providing uh, migratory bird, habitat and existing, existing usage and accessibilities for recreational, educational and research pur um, purposes and for other public uses. So if you go to the next slide. So this map, it's, there's a lot going on on this map, 
but you can see sort of on the Williams River, which is sort of mid to the left upper blue circle, that is sort of the proposed start to the Herrick's Cove um, start of the ORW. And it would encompass, you can see a blue dotted line, it kind of forms like a it would be helpful if I point my again, finger. Right, uh, <laughs> there's a lot going on there. Yes, yeah, so it's starting up here. So it starts kind of right before uh, I-91, comes down into Herrick's Cove, encompasses all of Herrick's Cove, and comes down into uh, the Connecticut River Point. So the idea is that everything within that waters, I should say, within that bubble, would be what would be proposed for a nomination for outstanding resource waters. So next one. So Great Falls, as we all know, is an exceptional um, historic site. And um, it's also, you know, archeological site. It provides habitat, um, existing water quality. It has, you know, presence of historic resources. And those historic resources range everywhere from um, the petroglyphs through the canal, which is the first canal in the United States. So it's not just looking, you know, it's looking at all ranges of history and uh, historic structures. So if we look at this next slide, so you can see the beginning is up near the, um, the bridge as it goes into North Walpole. It encompasses the canal and the natural channel of the river, and then down to just below, sort of where the, um, the historical society property ends. And so the one thing about this particular site is that we do share it with New Hampshire. Not all of it is in Vermont. So there, there will still have to be some uh, talks with New Hampshire and maybe some adjusting of the map as further discussions go, just because their ORW status process is different than ours. But um, at least the Vermont side of the waters, you know, is something that we can talk about with clarity. Okay, so the next one. So the Williams Re River Scenic Reach Area, this goes, um, this area is amazing sort of under not well known area unless you take the train over it or you happen uh, like <laughs> where we need to live right there. <laughs> um, it is an incredible uh, riverside outcrop that really doesn't exist in other parts of the state. So it's very scenic. There's actually a presence of two very uncommon species, uh, one plant, one animal that is in that area. And then it also fits the gorges, rapids, waterfalls, and other significant geologic features. So if we look at the maps of the next slide, you can see that the uh, blue dot there starts up on the Williams River, right around the Bro uh, Brockaway the Mills Bridge yeah. and the dam that's right there. And then it encompasses the stretch of river through the gorge. Well, the Sokoki Falls. Sokoki Falls. Falls. And then the gorge. Then the gorge. <laughs> and then comes around the bend and comes down through some lower falls to what's often known as like a sandy beach uh, swimming area there. Kind of behind the, um, the okay. truck stop and the, the log landing. logging area. So that whole stretch of river there has a lot of very um, natural geological beauty and uh, you know geological importance. And so that's why this site was recommended. Okay, so we can go to the next slide. So the ORW process. So this is a really, um, anytime you have something that's going through the state and going through such a big nomination process, it's quite a long process. So it's not like something that you submit the application and it will be done in a month. It's like, you'll be lucky if it's done in two years <laughs> process. So the process is, is that a local group submits a petition, an application to the Agency of Natural Resources and that's basically saying, we are nominating this site to be an outstanding resource waters, and here's why. 
And then uh, we go through the Agency of Natural Resources will consider um, all of the, they'll look at all the data at those sites that have been taken by the Department of Environmental Conservation. They'll look at the rules. They'll look at um, anything that, you know, needs to be taken into account. They will hold um, public engagement process within the town. So, you know, it's not a, this is the only time that it would go before the public. In this actual formal process, right, there's public engagement in the process. And, and then after consideration of all the relevant information, the Secretary of the Agency of Natural Resources shall designate the waters as outstanding resource waters. So that's kind of the formal process that it goes through. And um, it's a process that got an initial start of a lot of excitement many years ago. And then it sort of went into a holding pattern. And now the Agency of Natural Resources is really promoting this again to really um, look at the importance of our waterways and the significance that they have not only in the communities that those waters reside in, but to all of us across the state and federally. So it's three applications. It is three applications. Each, each site is a separate application. So if one of them doesn't make it, say we run into snags with New Hampshire, the other two still could end up being stars in our crown. Exactly. And so each one goes through by itself. But we are we decided because all three are such important resources in our community that we wanted to go forward with uh, the process with all three. All right, Steve, so we can stop sharing. And... Okay. Um, so yes, yeah, Steve Crofter, and um, I'm not on the Conservation Commission and I don't work for Wyndham Regional, I'm just here as a Rockingham citizen. And um, I'm re just really excited about um, this, possibility. Uh, we love coming to you, especially after hearing the previous reports that love coming to you with something that a suggestion of something that you don't have to do a lot of work on and that doesn't cost anything for the town. Um, but um, it feels important to me and, and I'm going to talk just for a minute and I know it's getting late, but um, having lived uh, in the house right above the gorge there and on the Williams River, um, it just is a spectacular part of the world. Um, and we're so lucky to have it here locally. Um, you know, everything from um, watching ravens feed babies in, their, in the nest on the cliffs of the gorge, um, or uh, waking up in the middle of the night to hear the ice going out uh, over the dam. You know, there's just a lot going on there. And it was in 2015 that Peter Bergstrom um, got the idea that we needed to get to give names to the unnamed waterways in town. And so as an abutting landowner to the waterfall there, um, he contacted us and um, because we lived there. And the suggestion was, well, of course, the falls might as well just get named Brockways Mills Falls because we have Brockways Mills Village and Brockways Mills um, Mill and Brockways Mills Gorge. And, um, you know, and, and just sort of thought to myself, well, that's a lot of things named Brockways Mills what about a um, name for, uh, you know, that has something to do with the indigenous people? Um, and in my mind, you know, that once lived here and are long gone. So I came to the select board meeting in some time in 2015 and the select board at that point said, great idea um, for it to have a native name, Steve, go find a name for us. And um, I naively thought that you know, well, Native people, you know, that's something from the past and Native folks don't live around here anymore. Well, I'm glad to know that I was naive and wrong and there are Native folks and my searching around and asking questions and meeting people eventually led me to Chief Roger Longto who lives in Jamaica but has family members living right here in Bellows Falls. And um, Roger got together with other Abenaki chiefs um, in New Hampshire and Vermont, and together they decided that an appropriate name would be Sokoki Falls. Um, Sokoki being the band of Abnaki that um, have lived in this part of the world for millennium. 
and um, and so the select board approved that and um, that suggestion and we applied to the um, state library board and extensive meetings and it was approved and then ultimately approved by the federal government. So Sokoki Falls is the name of the waterfall there just below, you know, begins at the dam by the bridge at Brockways Mills and uh, continues down as it turns the corner into the gorge. So that's, that's partly why I'm so excited. All of those reasons, cultural and historic and just absolutely beautiful nature there. And, um, and the other sites are equally deserving for sure. And um, so I guess just wanna see if you folks have any questions for us. Um, would be glad to try and answer them, Susan. Yeah, well, my question um, is about what's already existing there. You, you mentioned that they, they, they don't change what's already there. They don't change there what's there. Right. Cove, obviously, we have to deal with the dam. So they're in part of this discussion as well. Mm -hmm. And then the, the owner of the, of the small power dam, right. uh, Sokoke Falls yeah. area. So yeah. they're, so they're all involved in these discussions as well. Well, will be. Well, will be. Yeah. We'll be. Yeah. As, right. as Laurel mentioned, we came here first. Mm -hmm. you know, just yeah. And so the idea is to go now, if, you know, there's like, yeah, there's momentum, let's keep moving forward to approach other partners and uh, also talk with, you know, money, uh, other, you know, major landowners that would have questions. Right. But again, it's an anti-degradation law, so it's not saying, you can't have a dam, right? Right. It's like, and like the canal, right, is a historic structure. So it's saying, well, you know, if you wanted to remove the dam or the canal, that might be a problem. Right. But, right. Like we know there's construction, you know, in scheduled that's going to affect the canal. You know, that would have to be taken into account, obviously. Mm -hmm. so. Hey, I think it's a great idea. I like that they word it as exceptional, natural, cultural, recreational, and scenic values. You know, the, the fact there there's overlaps between natural and man-made resources. Because mm -hmm. uh, I always, I always say that natural and man-made resources are not separate; they are intertwined and one and the same. Uh, and it, it's just very helpful if you think of them that way, instead of separating them out into little boxes. Okay, so any questions the level of protection. So if someone decides they want to, they want to build a mansion next to the falls, is that our local zoning would say, okay, you passed all those. Would, would this provide us with another layer of protection saying, this violates the protected waters. Yeah, I think now. you know. I think it would. It would certainly have sort of a voice in, say, the Act Two Hundred and Fifty permit mm -hmm. process. Or it's not ever probably going to say no. You can't do X. It's probably going to say you can't do X unless you do this to protect the waters. So you can't put a sewage treatment plant right on the banks of the river. You're just going to put the effluent into the water. That kind of thing. I will say that um, so far, none of the sites in Vermont or that have been under the ORW designation has ever had it challenged. Like there's never been a you know ruling saying they can't go forward with something, they can't, but it just kind of gives an extra level of eyes. Okay, we also have this one. Yeah. So Thank you. I guess it would be useful just to say, yes, the Conservation Commission is going to be supported by the select board to move forward. Is yeah. that what I'm hearing? Yeah. yeah. Just wanted consensus to make it really clear. Thank you. Yep. Do we need a motion? Yeah, just consensus. That's lovely. Thank you. Well, thank you all. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Come in. Thank you all. And we'll keep you updated as yeah. we all go through that process. Yeah. Okay, next item on the agenda is uh, Bonnie's return. Swap drop uh, update. Um, there was a thing in your pack, I believe. Yeah, I, I don't want to spend too much time on this. Although, um, 
Uh, I have gotten several emails, and I think uh, others on the board have as well, from people concerned about this. So um, I want uh, the general public to know the reasons for, for my conclusions. Um, okay, so a couple of months ago, um, uh, Daniel Hovis brought a petition to the select board to uh, requesting that the swap shop be reopened. And uh, there was some discussion. There was a general, uh, a lot said about uh, the negatives involved with that, the hassles, the cost, and so forth. Um, I volunteered to work with Daniel and hopefully a small task force to discuss and look into and do some research how we could have one in Rockingham at our transfer station, uh, one that was run better and more effective and cleaner and organized all around uh, major improvement over what we had there before. Uh, so um, I spoke with Daniel on the side. I said they'd get together two or three other people and let's make some trips to Brattleboro, uh, Springfield, Springfield, and Walpole, where they have good swap shops. And he said, give me some time to put together a task force. And um, there, there never was a task force. So I went myself to uh, Brattleboro, Springfield, and Walpole. And I learned a good bit, um, just to let people know, uh, each of these uh, shops, operates a little bit differently. In Brattleboro, it's only a warm weather shop. The building they're in isn't heated. So they close down in November and reopen in late April. And um, in Brattleboro, the town allows them to use a building on the premises. Town has nothing else to do with the swap shop. It is run completely by volunteers. <clears throat> They're only open on Saturday afternoons, or Saturday mornings, I think it's 12 to, 12 to 1 or something. And two Saturdays out of the month, they accept donations. And two Saturdays out of the month, you can go and get things. On donation days, you cannot even go inside. You can only donate. And on pickup days, no donations are accepted. They're very careful about what they receive. On donation days, they usually have six volunteers checking what's brought in. So I was there uh, most kind of days and the transfer station in Brattleboro is maybe, I don't know, 10, 20 times bigger than ours. It's huge. And there's lots and lots of rooms, several buildings, they have their own entrance into the station and their own long drive. So cars line up to donate and these volunteers meet them and they just drive off. So that's how that operates. Walpole, now bear in mind, Walpole is a, a fairly wealthy town and it's in a different state. Um, they have a transfer station that's probably three times the size of ours. Uh, very, very, very well equipped, and they have a little auxiliary Sorry. building <laughs> Sorry. Uh, next to it that's designated for the swap shop. There's a window cut between the, the, the trash people and the, and the shop. Town employees handle donations. So, I mean, I've made several donations over there myself. And you have to take it to someone. They say, what is it? What's it worth? If it isn't immediately, they look it over. And if they say, okay, we'll keep it. They have a place where they put it and the people that volunteer in the shop can pick it up and put it in the shop. Um, and they are open all year round because that shop is heated. In Springfield, this one woman who is very saintly, I would say, uh, <laughs> if you know her. I do know she her. is. She, she is a uh, true Christian, uh, I would say. She does it all herself. She's been doing it for 24 years. Wow. And 
Again, the town isn't directly involved at all. They just give her a little building to work out of. She oversees everything that comes in. Uh, the building isn't heated, but she's there all year round. So it was interesting to see how these other places work. And to come back to our transfer station, I spent several hours on two different occasions watching the ebb and flow and exactly how things work down there <clears throat> and talking to the guys and getting a grand tour and, and everything explained, which was interesting. I hadn't really understood all of it before then. Uh, it changes quite a bit. I mean, it's sort of like the restaurant business that I used to work in when I was younger. You can go in there at one minute and everybody's sitting around doing nothing. <laughs> 20 minutes later, whoa, all hell's broken loose and everybody's losing their mind. But it's kind of like that down there. Sometimes people say, I go down there, nobody's, people are sitting around. Well, an hour later, they're probably not. Somebody's just pulled up with a refrigerator and whatever. Um, my conclusion is that we don't have enough room to do this way. All the other shops were either separate from the main purpose of the transfer station or in a, in a building that was separate. They all have their own entrances. Whoever's running the shop can handle the traffic flow coming in there. There's no other reason for people to come in there. What we have is one big building with open bays on the front and the back. It's metal, it's not heated. It floods during heavy rains on the western side. There's no way, and the problem with our other shop was that there was no way to keep any tabs on what was coming in. Too many people going in and out for not just to get in there, but to have other business in the building <clears throat> and leaving all kinds of terrible stuff. I don't, and we don't have the parking. In each of these other instances, there's plenty of parking so people can do what they need to do with their trash and recycling, park over here and poke around in the swap shop. We don't have that. It may look to you if you go down there at only slow times, there's plenty of room. <coughs> Excuse me. But there really isn't. Because if there are seven refrigerators over here, Christmas trees piled up over here, Somebody's got construction debris they're trying to unload over here. <clears throat> there isn't a lot of room. There isn't room for cars to park and people to really spend time poking around in the shop. Not without messing up the traffic flow. And I'm very proud of the way they have it working down there now. It really is, it functions very, very well. Everything's organized, it's clean. You can go through there even on a really busy day. Used to be sometimes the cars would be backed up so bad you couldn't even get in. People would be going down the shoulder of the road. And we have to do a lot more than we used to have to do. Uh, if the state is constantly mandating what you have to recycle and how you have to go about it. So that's changed over the years. So, I mean, a list of what we've recycled, not that much really goes to landfill down there. Your household waste, yes. And the construction debris, yes. But we recycle metals in the, what they call the metal bin. Um, we've got single stream for plastics and glass and paper, household waste. And then in the main building, and then we have tires and urine we collect, food scraps we collect. And in the main building, they take care of batteries, light bulbs, electronics. So that's a lot. There's not that much that we're actually collecting that's really going straight to landfill. And the old shop, sure, stuff came and went, you know, I mean, I, I remember taking a vase or something once, a couple little things, and I took some things there once. But it had to be cleared out every so often. I'm not sure how often. You might know, Peter, how often. Well, when I went down there, and I spent three or four years down there, both on Wednesday and Saturday, and we get stuff in, and we had, at that point, we had kids that were doing community service in the high school. Yep. 
And that kid would spend all day lugging the junk that was left in there out mm -hmm. and throw it in the dumpster, which the taxpayers pay for. Mm -hmm. right. So, so that's, that's the point. Um, the shop that we had, I don't, think, I don't think it did much to address the problem of too much going to the landfill. Because of the way it was run, because of what was allowed to come in there, it wasn't accomplishing that. It wasn't really addressing that concern. I think we should have a swap shop here somewhere, but I don't think we have room to do it right at our transfer station on Route 5 in Westminster. I'm sorry if people are disappointed with that. Okay, questions? Just thank Bonnie for undertaking that was a thankless. <laughs> yes, yes. And, and you know, you took a lot of grief, and I was one of the people who was, you know, really pulling for it, but you, you've investigated it thoroughly, and it's like being a saint at a location where we're yeah. going to. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, at one point I was, I was considering because yeah. move more, more land, but then <clears throat> Scott sent me the, um, the maps with the with the elevations and you just you can't you can't can't add any more land to what, what we've got down there. There's also the contaminated sites you really can't expand what you've got already. It's limited to the used uh, open land that you got now, which is just uh it's one point five five acres is all you got up there. All right. And it's wet one so you can't and there's well it's all downhill and stuff and it's all dumped debris and everything and you tell what you're sitting on right now. So, <laughs> there's mounds of stuff there. We used to shoot rats down there when we were kids. <laughs> and it, it's, it's, it's interesting. But anyway. Steve has a question. Yeah. Um, Bonnie, did, in the three places that you visited, do you have a sense if they had things that ultimately they realized weren't going to get given away? Did those just get added to the town's waste stream without yeah, in fact, compensation? Yeah, the, the, the saintly woman that in Springfield. Right. Alex, yeah. Yeah. She's work, I'll do it. She I'm really is. Yeah. She's really a very, very sincere and devoted mm -hmm. woman. Um, she said uh, she had a, a, a little quarrel with one of the Springfield select people uh -huh. who said something. They saw her loading up a big trash bag to take over to trash. Right. And they said, huh, you know, or something like that. And she said, yeah, every now and then I do, you know. But she has a little cute little donation box there. And she said, I always always get at least five dollars, ten, sometimes thirty, and I give it to the town. So she said, that pays for that. Right. And um in Brattleboro. They said, this is hard for me to imagine, but they said <laughs> most of the time when they have their pickup days, mm -hmm. everything is gone right. at the end of the day. But they're very careful they're about careful. what they take. I watched them send so many people away. Mm -hmm. You know, people come up with car loads and they get stand there and go through everything that's in their trunk and say, no, 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 no. And same thing in, in Walpole. Uh, they're very, very careful. And, um, uh, like for contrast, uh, Andrea uh, had probably 30 coffee makers, right? right? And Walpole, they had three. And they said, and so that's why we're not taking any more. Right. So that they're, they, they not only look at the quality of what they've got, they look at what they have on hand, None, no more of that, you know? So it's interesting, but the key to it are volunteers that are going to really be consistent about what they accept yeah. and a decent place, a decent location, and, and parking. Yeah. Parking is an issue for us with the limited space that we have. So, so that's it. Well, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think when I went to Walpole, I talked to the woman that ran that there. Swap shop is completely volunteer. They have yeah. a list of dedicated people. They they have a list, and if you don't show up, you call somebody else to cover for you. That has never happened around here, I can tell you. Yeah, um, they have a whole schedule. But what they do there is like well, she said, you bring it into the trash 
facility first, mm -hmm. they weigh it and it's a ghost of a swap shop. They don't want it, pay for it because it's not be that and take it home. They don't, right? Right, yeah, I've, I've got they weigh everything, yeah, they, they weigh, weigh everything. everything. But so, they have, you can believe the operation, they got, they got a lot of money involved, dusted over there. Yeah, they've got forklifts and everything. It's a it's a beautiful transfer station. They got good trash. <laughs> good trash. The only coach. thing that's missed down here and, and, and probably a wall too is the books. Yeah. The books because people use that for second library. But you you don't have to worry about getting back on time. You can get up, pay a fine. You're just down here and you know, and they transfer it around. But then again, the library, we had nobody volunteer and they ended up on the floor. And nobody's come across with boxes of books. I mean, you know, they, they're up there and sorted out. And find out so uh, anyway, that that's my report. And uh, if people are disappointed, I, I'm I'm sorry. Uh, I just tried to be as uh, candid about it and and as uh, unbiased. And that's my conclusion. Thanks for your work. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Bonnie, and thank you, Peter, too. I've already sent my congratulations to Bonnie on the email. I'm sure. Thought the report was well done. You have know, to remind people if you have quality stuff to give away, there are other places you know, mm -hmm. that yeah. you can donate your goods to that are right. resold at thrift shops. And, and the availability of you know, other Facebook groups. and all yeah. those things. If you want something, I, I, I go on Satin River and Bells Falls. A lot of times there's somebody saying, anybody know wants, a, wants this or can anybody use this? So, I mean, there's other options out there than just a swap shop. Yeah. 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 yeah well, also, Waffle, anybody can go to Waffle. Anybody can go to yeah. Springfield, too. Yeah. And, um, no, no, no. Well, you have to have a sticker. Thing. You have to have a sticker, but if you're only going to use the swap shop, you don't have to. Yeah. They never used to check stickers until I was there. Yeah, I, I, I see. Yeah. Week, they started checking stickers. But, um, <laughs> I mean, it, it's, it's easy to donate at Waffle, it really is. I mean, uh, I had a good friend. Uh, died uh, a few weeks ago, and I had to empty out his apartment. So uh, uh, I made several trips over there with, with, with nice things that they were happy to get, you know. So that's... Okay, we also have a swap shop. All right, that being said, let's move on to item six, which is a proof submission for TA grant, uh, transportation alternative grant for uh, a trail extension. There's information in your packet. And there's a motion on the front page, and Gary's here to uh, address and take questions. We, we, we went all through this. We, we, we did. We went through it at an earlier meeting, so it's not the first time you've seen it. And um, basically, it's a, a, a scoping application, and so it would operate uh, the same way that the, the one we're doing at the School Street Extension in Atkinson Street, where we... Um, we engage a municipal project manager, um, likely Wyndham Regional Commission, and the grant uh, uh, pays for that, some of the grant funds. And, uh, and they would identify um, the best um, alignment for the trail um, and uh, look for methods to make it you know, fully accessible. So being in the designated downtown and um, you know, walkable to all of Ellis Falls, they would... Identify a way to make ADA accessible, like ideally, if it's, if it's possible. It seems like it is. Okay, then your questions for Gary, or another question I have as usual where's the money coming from? 10,000 you're looking for. <laughs> We have some additional monies, remember. We hey, I, I always ask the question. And um, we do have money. I'm the money guy, and I watch that stuff. <laughs> yeah, so Someone's... we do have okay. some funds available. Okay, that. that's all we so, so the Walk the Bank Committee um, supports this application. We're working hard to provide public process, which is one of the criteria for the grant. We're having a, I mentioned that last time, we're having a forum in January for all the involved. By compared people. This would be such a benefit for our town if it came through. And we've got this beautiful waterfront. 19th century towns turned their backs on the waterfront. Most New England towns did. Now, if you look all around the country, people are developing their, their waterfronts as beautiful and peaceful places. So we're pretty excited about this. Or they just wish they had water. 
Exactly. <laughs> <You're> <laughs> Arizona, right? Yeah, there you go. You know, our outstanding water resources application. There's some yeah. real, you know, yeah. advantage to having water. Yeah. yeah. It's a good. Mm -hmm. Okay. There is a motion on the uh, front page. If someone wants to read that, we'll get this uh, operation all the way. All right. I move to authorize the municipal manager to execute application and documents and a support letter from the governing body. Of the applicant municipality with acknowledgement and source of the local match of ten thousand dollars for transportation alternative plan scoping study for the trail expansion of the Bells Falls historic riverfront park and trail system yeah, south second. through the remit. Second. 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 Uh, any further discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor say aye. 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 Hey, review 2024 general fund budget. It is. Okay, so I think we can still have Alyssa on her. Alyssa, you still on this? Unless she's engrossed in Dancing with the Stars or something and it's completely <laughs> blown us off by now. No, oh, she's I'm here. here. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Sorry to wake you up. So thank you for your patience, Alyssa. Yeah. So this is, like I said, this is a first cut. We will have at your next meeting a pretty in-depth uh, follow-up with highway, capital, ADA, uh, uh, ARPA money, and our debt schedule, because I know that's come up with various conversations with folks. So this is really, you know, we're not going to touch on that at this point. Um, I did hand out something to you just because if you look on the first page under um, CLG grants, we did not put a dollar amount in there in our proposed 24. And I did hand out some information that came from the Historic Preservation Commission from last night. They just went through and at least for, for their recommendation on the budget for 24, put some numbers together. Obviously the board has to look at this in a much more uh, intense detail in, in looking at the reserve fund question, but the CLG portion we will plug in so that number will, will be added. And that is a reimbursement, um, you know, the CLG uh, does get a reimbursement for that. So just so that you're aware right now, you'll see that number is a zero. Um, if you look about halfway down the page and that will be plugged in. Bigger issue obviously going forward is from our historic structures report presentation tonight is we obviously have significant financial challenges to bring the meeting house up to at least a, rehabilitation standard, I think, is what uh, Lisa kept calling it, as opposed to a full preservation standard. So we're looking at how we can get there. And if there is a Save America's Treasures grant, as Walter had pointed out, there is a, a, a option or there's a requirement, not an option for a match. And so how we would match that, and he has, for example, put a $325,000 number in their proposal. Um, as, as part of our discussions as we go forward with potentially looking at ARPA or possibly even an article, if it's something that the board would be interested in pursuing um, as we get into that discussion on the plan. Does that have to be town funds or other sources of funding can be matched for that grant? Um, there can be a mix of in kind funding, there can be private donations. Town funds, we should not use federal dollars. So, if for example, we have some chunk of money coming from the CLG grant, um, that we could not take any of that or part of that. Or the ARPA funding. Well, the ARPA funding. That's separate, though. Don't forget, we generally adopted the resolution, so we sort of push those funds into our general fund as part of that now i think the allocation of how we spend it is different so the select board will have more of a voice in that than if they think if they're part of the general fund yes the way that we did that we did the replacement funds for covid uh, if you remember yeah so we have we have more flexibility now as to how we can apply those funds if I may, um, that 325000 is a placeholder that's essentially based on conversations, assuming that there uh, would be a pulling together of uh, some ARPA funds, or some former ARPA funds, if you will, um, uh, as well as uh, funding from uh, town articles. 
over a two year period, not within the, the way that the cycle goes with the um, state of American treasuries. Even if we were to apply for the current cycle, we would not be seeing that money until next fall. And, we're not, and we would have up to two years to spend the money. So we could accumulate funding in the reserve fund. That's the assumption. That's, that's one underwriting assumption. It's not that we need all that in, in, in you know, just one fell swoop. Mm -hmm. It's part of it. So, yeah. so there are some, like I said, there are some numbers that we'll have to plug in under, under that first page. Um, I'll just, we'll just jump through it real quick and then we can go back and have more substantial conversations because I'm sure there's questions and also I can have Alyssa jump in as well. Solid waste and recycling, if you've noticed, we have increased our, our, um, our budgeted figures. We have been consistently over our cost estimates. I guess it's a good news, bad news proposition. You know, we're busier, we're taking in more materials with the cost of disposal. For all those materials is increasing and so you'll see that that's uh we're still not running the profit uh we've closed our gap but we have not been able to at least run the break even and at this point i'm not anticipating based on our looking at the numbers from 24 that we'll be running at a break even for 24 either so the um theater if you look at the third page a lot of the theater is again um Pushing and Charlie had presented to you as part of the red update that we are looking at adding more live production and shows that gives us a greater uh, return on the theater theater use than right now we're experiencing for movies. Movies are really in a sort of a strange position right now. You can see it nationally, and we're no different. You know, the people have not really returned to the theaters and the numbers I think they anticipated and the streaming and other competition. Um, you know, how the first run movie theater works is going to be an interesting um, conversation as we go forward. So we'll see that we definitely have some challenges as we try to maintain, uh, which is a very important uh, community asset that we want to continue uh, to provide. Um, not a lot of other changes. I think the one thing is we went forward through um, just general town operations. Any of the really the, the built-in increases are mostly related to uh, inflationary pressure on, on just our operating expenses. There are no real new programmings uh, that we have proposed and there are no additional staff that we have proposed in the budget at this point. Um, there are some things that we have kept in, in, in the budget that we will really, at this point, we're not sure of. Um, we'll have to see as we go forward um, how we do with our uh, fuel costs as we've all experienced you know, a pretty significant increase in heating oil. And now it seems like that market is, is more volatile than ever. It's, it's going up and down. So we did forecast it um, to the best of our ability, but again, it's it's really sort of you know worth the with the vagaries of the market how that's going to go as we go forward. Um, so those are the big things. Um, the employee benefits, a uh, couple of things on there. There's just your information that, that are impacted. We had discussed that the premiums had increased on the base premiums across the board on all the offerings with Blue Cross. That was a state of Vermont decision. Um, we did, we're in the middle of our open enrollment period for the enhanced uh, benefits that we had discussed and that you had approved at the previous board, tri-board meeting. Uh, so we'll see how those numbers ultimately shake out. We had a slight increase in our Beamers uh, um, contribution. That was a, again, a state mandate. That's something that, uh, that we had built into those numbers as well. So, you know, we shouldn't see a significant change. Um, this is our last year for our service agency requests and the current funding levels for those. And I had sent Peter uh, something that another community has done where they go through an evaluation process in terms of how they evaluate 
various requests for uh, funding. So it's something that I think Peter's interested in. You know, we are at that five year renewal for next year and how we want to start a process to engage members of the board and others to try to evaluate those um, and ask the agencies as well as new, uh, potentially new agencies to participate. It's probably going to take up a good chunk of your time next year. It was an interesting uh, information you sent out. That was something similar to what we tried to do several years ago. You had mentioned there. that, so and that's we, why I pulled that out. We bunched this down at one point. This whole service agency was $120,000, believe it or not. And we finally set up a committee to screen all the applicants and we asked them to provide all this information, who they serve, all this thing, and are any other towns that they serve contributing. And there was a little tension at points on some of these articles, but uh, we did, we were able to knock it down to $70,000, believe it or not. And now it's trying to creep right back up because every time you turn around, there's another person knocking on the door or increasing you know, I'm looking for increased stuff, and some of these are duplicates. They all do the same type of thing. So I think if we were to set up a screening committee, or not this year, because this year if we vote on the whole bunch, but next year where each one gets voted separately, 23, 24, that's where we should need to set up a committee to screen these. Uh, and they are really, it, it makes a difference because you can really sort out the ones that aren't going to weaken. We just got another one from Brownsboro, believe it or not, looking for a handout. So, oh yeah, many hacks in the community, they just turn the money over, you know, no, they don't ask the tough questions. So I, I want to uh, see if the historical this is another one. Here's another one. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you think the historical I already donated to one from Brownsboro, cut it out. <laughs> It is the a season couple, of giving. A couple thousand dollars <laughs> yeah. to help us maintain the riverfront park. Yeah. That's been a, a constant source of um, stress on the historical society. And I did not budget any money in here, but it's, it's an item I know that causes a tremendous amount of volunteer burnout trying to maintain. It, it costs it costs money and it costs money to keep everything it costs money. There's nothing free no matter what they tell you there's nothing free yeah and somewhere on <laughs> the world there's somebody coming to line your door saying yeah mm -hmm. uh, we, we don't really have any income yeah uh, just, <laughs> you yeah. know donations but these groups also provide a service to our community so you have to balance that out it's well that's true no i'm not saying service. right now but so yeah. the park is a service to the community up there it mm -hmm. is to everyone in the community. So do we need to, to put a date on when we're going to establish this committee, Peter? I would do it, you know, sometime after a town meeting and, and set up and then get them out so they start processing their, start processing eliminated. I mean, that was in August they started. Yeah, they started, they started in August. August at the, at this town of Weathersfield. Mm -hmm. And it's a very detailed process they go through. And if you don't submit by that date, too bad you're out of luck, you don't get don't get any money. Mm -hmm. So I mean it's a hard stance to take, but you know, you gotta start looking at the taxpayers' pockets, especially with the economy the way it is right now. It's, it's gonna be our tough job this year. And next year probably following. So. so is it is it too late now to get something in for request for no. next year? No, you have to put a petition in. As a new organization, you have to put a petition in. Oh, okay. And that gets over to town meeting from the floor whether they yeah. want to fund it or not. Okay, so but you don't get Stuck into that bundle. No, that that. no. Okay. that's a five year process of the, okay. you know, the, the complete review is every five years. But yeah, you can do individual requests. Uh, <coughs> I want to point out to you again the ambulance uh, contract. We were still working on looking at alternatives. We kept it at a level funding. I don't think we're going to stay at level funding, but I just wanted to bring that to the board's attention that right now that's the placeholder we have on there. Um, Scott, will the competition possibly bring that number down? No, no. Sad part is competition is actually going to increase that number. Yeah. Whoa, how does that work? Because well, you're going it's to, a quality versus quality of service you got to work at. Yeah. But I'm not at this point, we still I'm hoping that we can have a meeting next week and, and the fire equipment folks can look through, you know, all of the first responder folks can look through our options and then we'll come back to the board on the 20th. Okay. Where we are. Was the issue with the temporary use of the Bell's false fire 
Department, is that a resolve that came up at the tri board meeting? Yep, yeah, it's resolved. Good. Yeah. So anyway, so that's just that's just again. Uh, we got slammed. Well, our board got slammed on that one from from Mr. McCall. Thanks. Saying they didn't, we didn't tell anything to them about doing that. That's not a story for them. That will... There's a whole host of items on uh, under capital projects that we're going to go through the next time. So I don't want to jump into that in great detail. Some of it deals with stuff in the current year budget. Some of it deals with stuff that we're going to have to talk about with the roof and some other projects. Um, obviously in the reserves, you can see that there's some issues. Um, gravel pit is a, is a conversation we'll have as well. We're at a point now where we have to start and we're going to look at doing an RFP for um, trying to mine some of the area that then we'll have to do the closure on. Um, and that's sort of the period that piece that's abutting Bucky Adams has bought the you know, garage property there, the Savages garage, and there's some mining already going on there. Um, but that's not us, that's a private uh, activity. But we'll have to do some on ours because we'll be at a certain point we're going to start. I don't remember where we are in our five enclosure, but we're, we're getting close. So we'll mine our material. We'll have to do some reclamation and loaming of some of our other lands. And in the spring, GMP is supposed to be coming in in some of the areas that we're going to mine. And then they'll be putting in the transmission lines, which will then go out and connect to the new solar array. So that's happening in the spring. Is income from the solar array, uh, does it appear anywhere here? We did not put the income in until we know for sure that um, they're going to do the uh, utility work as well as when the, uh, that, that triggers his responsibility to us for the 50,000. So we did not include it in our annual budget estimates at this point. Um, we'll have a whole update on our, our bonding and our, and our debt schedule. Um, as we talked about sort of the debt diet, one of the things the fire equipment committee we've talked about is we don't want to take on additional debt for, for vehicles. And as you can see, you're, you're still paying off previous uh, vehicle acquisitions. Um, so those we're trying to basically um, get those off the books before we get into any larger scale um, acquisition. Um, so that's part of why we talked about retrofitting and, and potentially working at our equipment mix to see, are we overstaffed, are we over, the word is, I guess we've got too much equipment, not enough manpower. Scott, question on that. If, if the report that, that this consultant's going to provide for us on the fire department, if it suggests some ways of sharing equipment or merging two departments or whatever, that would affect very much the, the, the debt planning, wouldn't it? Because we won't. Yeah, because if you saw that replacement schedule that we had looked at yeah. in our joint meeting, it's a substantial amount of it's money. It's scary. It's in the millions. And, you know, again, we're sort of previewing our next meeting, which is a lot of big, big topics, but obviously the board wants to, uh, you have to bond for some of our expenses on the bridge projects. And so that really starts in, in earnest probably by 26 or 27, because I think, you know, based on the schedule that they gave us, um, you know, they'll be into construction and ultimately, you know, taking out the old bridge by 27. Um, we still have not heard on the Bridge Street Bridge. We did ask to be included in the uh, regional program for replacement for that. So I'm hopeful to hear something if we were qualifying to get that bridge done. And then we're, we've already talked about wireless and how that sort of jumps right back into the schedule starting in like 27, 28. So, so where do we stand on Depot Street Bridge? We haven't heard anything from them even, right? They want to come back and have a conversation with you. And I'm trying to figure out when we want to do it to talk about galvanizing versus painting. And there's a host of different colors and then the potential for what the cost would be into the future if you decide to paint. And the, and the bike pen committee, the walk bike committee also sent some recommendations made by uh, Jonathan Weber from uh, Locomotion. He's, he's, he's a volunteer in our committee. In terms of the, for example, expanding the, the bike ped bridge is only eight feet wide now. And he thinks that, and we sent his suggestions to the VTrans folks via Scott um, that that should be wider. 
and some other things, some other suggestions. Not that we'll add a lot of money to make it two feet wide, but so I mentioned who knows who's but but they that uh, that went up, and I got a note back from that shape. You know, from the woman who's heading the the, the, uh, the project for the, for the Canal Street, <clears throat> uh, rather Depot Street, they said they're going to incorporate, they're going to review some of the suggestions that were made by this guy and get back to us at presumably at this meeting, Scott, that you're talking about. Yeah, I only had very preliminary conversations with uh, the engineers, and, and we have to do a little bit more work to sort of put together a more in-depth presentation. I don't know if we'll make it for the meeting of the 20th. We might have to push it into the first meeting in January, just because I think the meeting of the 20th is going to be pretty comprehensive with all of our budget uh, stuff. So I think that one's going to require probably its own meeting early in January. <laughs> and what about this uh, bridge reserve line? Yeah, I was just going there. Thank you. Because I, so we haven't put anything in there. And that's why I asked about bridge street bridge. I mean, people are doing bridge. Because we should be putting money in because that's kind of when that comes up, it'd be nice to have a little yeah. thing on our pocket to help defray some of that expenses. I thought we had to Oh, we used it. I think we used some of it. Yeah, we've done that for a while. That's why, yeah. Yeah. I know. for some reason, we just haven't put it. That would be years now. I thought we had 50,000 we were sitting in there. I for. thought we did last year. I think there was 40,000. And I think, Alyssa, we talked about this, right? There was 40,000, and then some of that was spent. And then I don't know. And yeah, those been spent because you can just look at the expenses for right. line. There's charges to the people's street bridge in there. Right. So last year, you took 100,000 from fund balance to offset your tax rate. Um, so far, just looking at our first cut of the general fund, if you look at the, the bottom line numbers, we're still um, a little below where we were last year. Um, we, we do still have some modifications to make, like I said, with the CLG and a few other items to add to this. And then obviously the discussions on highway and um, capital will impact that as well. Um, was there anything you wanted to jump in before the board sort of jumps in? Nope, I'm just going to try and look up the uh, bridge reserve while they're talking. Okay. Um, are you taking questions? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Right. That was just a highlight. It was not meant to be a comprehensive. Uh, on the second page, I guess, the only thing I'm request, uh, can we get these pages numbered? It's a little easier if we say go to page such and such. Right now, we don't know where we are yeah. other than mentioning something, but on the Actually, the second page in the uh, start with total revenues. You get on the manager. You, got, you and I talked about this, Scott. We've yes. been around. Executive assistance and manager, there's an increase there. What's the plan there? That's from 12 6 to about 12,020. Part of that is we've been splitting a position with um, and offsetting some of that time with uh, grant revenue. So we've been using some of Betsy's time. So that's some of that's an offset to her time. And then we've also been using it, some of it when we get grants, there's administrative offsets, which we then use to help pay some of that other time because we keep track of the grants. And so really that's what that is supposed to be there for. Not and I have been running around while having a full time Mm. Executive assistant. Mm -hmm. We talked about that earlier, didn't we? Um, right. You know, we used to have one, and that took care of all the minutes and gets posted and agendas getting out in time. Mm -hmm. uh, all the uh, ordinances and stuff being updated. I know there's a book that you guys have been enjoying going through. Sue's got one. I've got one. Mm -hmm. uh, it's about three inch stick fold, and there's one in the office, but it, it's all ordinances and it updates and tells who's elected to what and how long they're in there and all that. That was all updated by the executive system. So, uh, you know, if we had someone full time or three quarter time, I don't know, uh, that might alleviate the, the log jam down there. I don't know how the rest of you guys feel about that. But, I but think got, sorry, go ahead. Well, go ahead, buddy. I, I think we should. Yeah, I think about Scott's productivity because. Well, you're that, your own. that was the point I was, I know at one time you said, well, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. I said, yeah, but if we had something else and they would take that off of that load, you know. Uh, yeah, I'm concerned about your 
stress level, work level, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> hey, does he look like he's stressed? Come on. I don't think the stress has gotten his goddamn house. He hides the stress level. He's got it. But anyway. That doesn't mean he didn't have much trouble. We know you're a performer, Scott. We thought you on the stage. But, um, but seriously, would it help your productivity to have someone like that or not? It, it would help for sure. I mean, like anybody, right? We're, we're juggling multiple balls and even tonight, right? Everything we talked about, all of these items require follow-ups and, you know, yeah. cannabis control resolutions to the state. Yeah. And would that person attend our meetings perhaps and help take notes and then, or not? It's possible, you know. Depends on the job to try and we, we come up with. Mm -hmm. I mean, others would probably come up with some pretty good job description. I mean, the challenge is run through. The meeting recording too. Right. And physically have to and there's a thousand and one details, right, of things that we talk about here that require follow-up. Silly things like putting posting signs on gates at the at the uh um, the transfer gravel, pit, the gravel pit. Right. That you know, I'll leave myself a note, but it's in a pile. Right. At some point we'll, you know, I check with Andy and it'll get posted. So it's things like that where somebody would be able to really Yeah. I mean follow. when we when we had Carrie here, I mean she was sort of the first line of Creating that list, oh, yeah. she managed that list, she and she, um, you know, so it, it did take a huge workload off. Oh yeah. Well, well, do we have Mr. Mm -hmm. Ari to insist on this? We should have it to budget. We just did not. We, we didn't hire a conversation. Peter, you know, has talked about it, so okay. well, we can certainly add something to the process. What What do you think, Peter? What do I think? Yeah. Do we add it to the budget? Make a full. I think we should. I've I've been for that. I should. I mean. Yeah. For years, I've been for that. And then we went through a series of people who didn't right. work out because it's a, it's not an easy position. Right. No. And um, I mean, maybe a three quarters, something where it's, you know, the part of the problem is um, it's not necessarily a highly paid position either. So um, I bet that you do have good benefits. Right. Um, but it could be someone who has, you know, a, a family that it could be worked around a school schedule, for instance. So, um, well, my invention, two, two well, viable candidates, good viable candidates to Scott. But I don't know. I just either a lot of them are because of previous issues with the other administration. They're, they're mm -hmm. it's burned once, shy twice. You know, mm -hmm. just, and it's trying to. Even if you tell them Scott's a good man to work for, they just say, yeah, yeah, I've heard, I heard that before, you know. <laughs> so, you know, we try to push that, and, it, and I don't know what happened with it. Well, you know, if we if we uh, describe the position as uh, flexible hours and let someone work during uh, school hours, but also attend our meetings. That would be good. Yeah, you, know, you know, the trustee meetings, the select board meetings, the joint board meetings. Well, that's always been part of the problem, though, because yeah. if you're working a full day and then your meet your your day gets extended to nine, nine o'clock, yeah. um, <laughs> with the Zoom now, with I mean, you don't necessarily have to be here. You well, right, well, but I meant later you, by Zoom or whatever. Yeah. yeah. But also, I meant like the de the job would would end like at three p.m. So you would just just work a, a shortened work day. Right. But. We'll look at something and I'll, yeah. I'll, we'll update that, so. To make it so that uh, someone with kids in school. Yeah, I mean, I think it's something the manager could, yeah. I mean, it all depends on the person, but I think we need to put money in the budget lines for that. Yeah, I, I think, think we so really too. need to put, I've been for yeah, that and for then, years. You know, to get closer to D-Day here, we can always slice something if we have to, I mean, at that point, we, you know, it's, <laughs> we're gonna be, we're, we're gonna be pairing a few things, I'm sure. Because there's yeah. big stuff coming in the highway discussion. Yeah. And, and, yeah, obviously the paving. It's a big conversation we have to have, and um, there's all options that we'll look at in the capital. And, and like you said, if we want to start building reserves, um, reserves for the roof on this building, that's one of the things we have to talk about. You know, we have some pricing beyond the stuff we've already talked about, which is the reinforcement of the trusses and, you know, and, and getting the theatrical system up and running. So. And to raise the other issue that we've been discussing and getting emails about is a service contract with Wyndham uh, County I Sheriff. And, and I don't know whether we just put in, 
I mean, I just, of course, Alyssa would have to figure out how to how to manage this, but I mean, as we already know, Rock, uh, Bellis Falls residents will not be happy having that in the complete Rockland budget. We know that going forward. Saxons River already has a contract it's 7,500 a year, I believe, for three hours a week. Mm. Um, I don't know whether, I mean, figuring out how to put it in, maybe do you increase, say you ask contract out for 10 hours a week, and then Saxons River no longer has their individual contract, but they have their three hours. Um, I don't know, you know, book wise, you know, for the budget wise, how you would manage that and how, how would you pull out what Rock, uh, Bells Falls residents will not want to pay um, towards that. I mean, it's, I remember looking, according to what they sent us, I don't know if I can find it now, but like 10 hours a week, I think turned into about seventeen, eighteen thousand dollars $18,000 a year, yeah. if I remember right, something yeah. like that. Um, yeah, it's in that neighborhood. It's going to be yeah, fifteen to eighteen thousand. Something, something right. like that. At the sixty-two dollar an hour figure, right. right? Which is what the sheriff's contract. Yeah. But then there's the question of, well, they only have five people, and if you add on another, that's that's somebody's, you know, that's a that's a quarter of a person, and they're already stretched thin. Also, Westminster's considering firing. Yeah. yeah. So we, we better check on what kind of. Yes, yeah, Scott and I. We can talk and talk about that, but I, I did get an email from I, I I stuck my neck out and asked Sarah if she could come up with some numbers what they were thinking of doing for it. Mm -hmm. So her reply was about four hours a week, which I think is overkill. Well, honestly, so um, if you think of that, four hours uh, mm -hmm. a week times four weeks is sixteen hours times twelve is a hundred and. 92 hours at 62 bucks because you got to have 2,000 hours before you get there. So that amounts to about 12,000 bucks. And that's just for Barnesville? Just for Barnesville. Yeah, which then, honestly, I mean, I live there and I hate the speeding. We do have problems. Um, and a lot of the problems come down to a few people. I mean, some of the more serious problems, a few people who live in the near vicinity, mm -hmm. that the Wyndham County Sheriff's honestly would not be dealing with. It would be the state police dealing with those issues. Yeah. Um, so- and, and Peter's point about what about Cambridge Court? What about the other parts? You know, I in, think it has to be town-wide. If, if we put it in the budget for say, that 16,000, 10 hours a week, that has to go town-wide. Mm -hmm. um, and the thing is you also can't, it has to be randomized too, because if you say, okay, they're gonna be here every Tuesday from one to two, you're going to slow down from one to two. You're not. Yeah. It's, right. Well, I think you target certain days and yeah. certain activities, but you're right. It can't be every Tuesday at, at the Bartonville Bridge because that's yeah. silly. Right. Yeah. That becomes self defeating. So I think silly. going forward, I think that the, I'm, I'm, to my opinion is that if we're going to do the police thing, it should be an article probably on the town warning. To see if people want it, then you can find out if the rest of the town wants to pay for it. Fine, we're golden. Go that's, ahead. That's a good way to handle it. Yeah. Put it out there but, to the town. But if the if the vote is no, well then what do you what's the answer to the Barnesville people? I mean, well, as we said, they can fight and make their own district and. That's not going to happen. Just, so, just why is that? Can't we, because we can't afford it. I mean, sixteen thousand dollars with a with a road with. 20 people, 20 houses. And then you've got people who live out of state who own land who don't stay there. They're not going to be happy with that coming in under tax. Not going to happen. I mean, and of course, the other situation you've got to have if we do just Barnesville, then Tax and Herb's going to come in knocking on the door it's saying, it. well, they're getting it. Why aren't we getting, why aren't you paying for ours? No, we can't, we can't do that. Can't. Yeah, I think so, I mean, it's yeah. crazy. It's it's like, we're, we're, yeah. I think the only way it would work is if you include Tax and Herb in it. And you say, okay, you no longer have to come out of, out of this with your in your separate budget. That those three hours gets incorporated in the ten hours that's right. going town wide. But the trust then you still have the problem with bell halls. That's one thing that you you may find that's the same as the fire department. So it's going to be we want control of what they we want them to do, not what you're going to tell them to do. Well, so, no, you could do that in a contract. Well, you could you could have they they wouldn't change their contract. It just wouldn't be wouldn't be. Paid for separately in the Saxons River taxes, it would be incorporated in in the 
Yeah, I'm not yeah. saying that. I'm just saying that the, that this is a control factor. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? They're going to say we want to be able to tell the sheriff what to do, not just because everybody's paying for it. You know. Wouldn't they report to Scott though? And Scott would be the meter. I would. You would yeah. think that well, would be that's some kind of. That's been one of the biggest complaints in Westminster is when yeah. they do arrive in town. Right. Nobody has any idea where they were, when they were, that's why they were. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's and then they get a bill and they're they're frustrated because they it's didn't feel like they were they were they were they was the same yeah. as Scott was just saying in Westminster. They yeah. get a bill and people like, said, what, what do you mean? We didn't see anybody in here. Yeah. Yeah. So Yeah, I know it's 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 and a like challenge. Said, yeah. They don't have enough personnel go around, you know. They only have five. Yeah, yeah I mean, how, how are they gonna so. add another another town? I mean okay. I, I don't know if there's any other, I mean, it would be great, but there's also people who live in Bartonville who don't want police presence in town. So, I mean, um, what are they going to do? Sit on the side of the road and just wait for someone to speed by? And a lot of people are uncomfortable with seeing a police car just sitting there all the time. Yeah. You want somebody, if you have an issue, if you see someone dealing drugs at the bridge, which we do, you want to have someone who can respond quickly. Well, we don't have that in any case, even if we contract out mm -hmm. to Wyndham County yeah. Sheriff. Um, because it depends where they are, and you can't predict a lot of times that happens at night. They're probably doing it right now because it's oh, dark. Right. So, um, I don't know what the answer is. I'm just as frustrated as the rest of my residents and the rest of the people who walk the roads of rural Rockingham and don't like to have people speeding by mm -hmm. and don't like people on their cell phone. I mean, I nearly got hit a couple times already. Um, just because someone squirms away because they're on their cell phone. Yeah. And they don't see that I'm walking my dog on the side of the road. <laughs> Amazing. The law is yeah. out there. They're not supposed to be. You're supposed mm -hmm. to be trying to do it, but then they go right to town. Right. <laughs> but I don't know whether we just put it in there as a placeholder so that, okay, we've had this discussion. This is what it would cost. We don't know if we can manage it. I, I we have to work out the issues with Bellas Falls and with Saxon River. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of things that have to be worked out. Yeah. Um, I like Peter's idea of bringing it to the people, though. Yeah. And, and, and that so, way, yeah, that, like Sue said, throw in the 16000 for, you know, whatever it is, and for, you know, the thing, put it into the placeholder, and then, uh, yeah. you know, we, we know and if, if, it, if it so happens that it goes down, we, we don't spend the 16000 some of that, that we just have to go down the road further from there and start seeing and okay. get, get a response from Sac River, what, what they think. I mean, I'm sure there's going to be people say, that's a great idea. We want to pay for it. <laughs> they, they pay for it in the roundabout way. Yeah, it's still it, it, but they still pay for it. So right. I mean, so more, instead of having it in the village, but it's going to be town wide. Different, we, different we've given the emphasis that, well, we pay town taxes too. The story you always get when, when this uh, situation comes up. But yeah. I mean, when it comes down to what $16,000 is to a, someone whose house is valued at $150,000, it's not a lot of money for an individual person. Right. but we're not, there's the problems of the service and why pay that extra 20 right. bucks in your taxes right. if you're not getting the service, not getting and, service and right. you're not, so that's you know, another situation. or you're, you're angering all of those falls who doesn't want to have to pay much. <laughs> so what, what, what if we would invite the sheriff? Last time, remember the sheriff couldn't be here? It's not the sheriff, was he? Wasn't he? No, no, he no said, it was a representative. He was, was a right. right. I know there were two here, but I thought then when I read the minutes, it was a lieutenant, I guess. Right. So, so. can we invite the sheriff here? It'd be good if we work some of these questions through with the sheriff before we took this any further, right? Well, well, the other I thing don't is, think we're going to get the answer. So. Well, well, like how many people do you have? Well, you know, we've already said, they've already said in, in that letter that they had thought. And also, why is Westminster unhappy? You know, well, the other thing is, this is probably sticking an neck out with a short rope and <laughs> get up at a joint board meeting where all three <laughs> boards are there, uh, and you're going to get the argument of why it's Saxon River probably jump on the suit. Maybe they wouldn't. And then you get Bell's Falls opposition to being the dad. So that would give you some interest going into town meeting. Right. Where you want to go. Yeah. I don't know if there's any way. Your I mean, this is a well, yeah. say this is an illicit question. Well, I, I, mean, I know. Say if we did Crazy. if we did put the money in the budget, is there any way then we could put it? Okay, so this is many taxpayers in the town of uh, of the village of Bellas Falls. We credit their budget the five thousand dollars or whatever it is, so that then they they're not paying for it in their taxes. Right, they're basically three three thousand dollars fifty two hundred is what right? 
the three ratio, fifths? I don't know. What the I think it's 3,000 people in Bellows Falls and 5,200. Well, that's people, yeah. not necessarily taxpayers. Oh, okay. So no. I don't know what is for taxpayers. But that's a night, I imagine it's a nightmare. <laughs> okay. That would be a question for Nimerick for sure. Yeah. <laughs> okay. but it could just be a simple transfer of, you know, this is what you would have had to pay. Here's your 5,000 bucks. I don't know if that's an answer to stop that problem. Okay. Um, let's, let's move along here. Uh, a town hall, I guess it's a third sheet in. Mm -hmm. uh, Wake is maintenance and zeros there. That's because you're not going to call up for any uh, maintenance on the building or whatever. But they used to have, we used to, remember Bruce Bennett was hired at one point a couple of years ago and he got, he got uh, dismissed. So uh, I, I'm not complaining about it. I'm just wondering. I no, we, we do have, we do have cleaning in the building. I just don't think we, we have put it. Okay. I'm well, trying to, to so you, you might have dumped it. What number here. is that? It was on the third page. It's the uh, under town hall expenses 110, 10, 3, 7, 20. Okay. So we have $2,500 in, oh, $18,000 in custodial services. Yeah, that's why I didn't know you might have jumped this someplace else instead that's of having right. a dedicated person for maintenance. That's all. <clears throat> we just we had a figure in there for a dedicated person at that point, sometime mm -hmm. before. Right, yeah. right, we have the contract. Okay. And Scott, sorry, quick question. The insurance, does, is there insurance on the meeting house? Is that included in line 3950 buildings and contents? All of our property is insured. All right, so including including the meeting house. Mm -hmm. And how in the hell do you insure the meeting house? From what we just heard. <laughs> well, the, you know, the, the problem is it doesn't really realistically have the placement value because it, right. it, it, there's a substantial loss. You're not going to be able to replicate it. Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, at that point, you're doing that. You're doing a partial restoration at best, right? I mean, it won't be the is, same if it burns. For what is the amount of our property insurance? Well, it comes under general liability, mm -hmm. right? So I think we have a $10 million umbrella. And then I think there's also, I'd have to double check on what the individual coverages are on the big umbrella. Mm -hmm. Might even be in the book. Let's see. Do you have the book there, Alyssa, with the um, binders for the insurance? I do not have the actual um, insurance policies, no. I can look it up in the binder. I just don't recall it off the top of my head. Uh, how about under professional services, uh, first item tax expense? We're not on the number in there at uh, tax sales expense. It was 34, 35 a couple years ago. Well, we had put money in this year's, which I think we'll just continue to use. And then I'm hoping we don't have to do another tax sale. If we, if we, by the time we get this one done, I wouldn't think we'd have to do another one right away. So this one will happen in this fiscal year. Yes. Peter, the way that the tax sale expense gets, it gets charged back to the landowner that incurred that expense. I know. So there shouldn't be, there should be like, there might be like a couple hundred dollars, but nothing that we can really budget. We don't know. The fact that expenses, you know, the lawyer's fees and stuff. So I know that that all gets paid back when the property sold, so. Yeah. Right. And we charge it directly to that property. So when it sells or when the homeowner pays, it just gets paid there. Yeah. Good. Um, I don't know, I found that the things not being numbered kind of screwed up here. Trying to <laughs> Sorry, I forgot that from last year. That's all right. Uh, <laughs> bank charges. Um, we didn't, we're not throwing a number. I think it was like $9,900 or something like that. I think we had it someplace I saw a weird number like that sticking out. For the, for the credit cards? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, you we don't, we're it? no longer charged for that. Okay, well, it's fine. Oh, good, good work. Yes. That's, that's fine. I'm just, so you know, just asking questions. Win-win. <laughs> we like being the good stuff. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, now, Barker Street, there's no figure for that. We'd settle a contract for Barker Street, but there's no figure in this. Because it's thing. a 24 budget. We don't anticipate the work's going to be done this winter. So yeah. We're going to end up in the current fiscal year. 
But now the hundred thousand on the capital, uh, uh, not that, that's under uh, current capital. Uh, yeah, under the capital. So for the truck, uh, you've got a hundred thousand to a fire department here. So I think it's for the truck that we're, or anticipation repairs to rock and truck, I think. It's under reserve. <laughs> We're still waiting on the rest of the, the numbers. To yeah, we won't know that to the meeting of the 20th because they, uh, the, the company that, yeah, does, the, the yeah. that does the, the restorations won't have those numbers until then. Does the tone contract work for all three of our fire departments? Is that shared among the fire departments or how's that apportioned? They each have their own contract for that because they all carry their own pages. And so, and that, that's their. They're, they're dispatched separately. They're dispatched separately. Why would you, why would that be? Because they, they doesn't they don't have to know that I'm going to this fire, you're going to that fire. Well, <laughs> <laughs> Just like, how do we how do we get into how much time do you have? <laughs> okay, <I hope> <laughs> Can you make, can, can you make, um, there's no short answer to that. There okay. is a protocol for responses, and there is a, um, a whole series of uh, based on dispatching and the type of fire that it is, who is supposed to respond. But it, it's not always consistent how it works. And can so, our consultant look at that? That's exactly one what of the issues about. that will come out of this is just how that is working or not working. Good. Mm because -hmm. okay. that's, that's 20,000 bucks. Firefighting is not cheap. Volunteer firefighting is not cheap. The cost of the apparatus, the cost of the equipment the guys wear, the cost of the training, the cost of communications. We're going to have a radio grant coming for the next meeting. $100,000 to do upgrades for repeaters, digital radios, so they can share on a scene and have multiple. That's the other thing. Every fire department has their own radio frequency. So you can get on a fire scene, and they might not literally be able to talk to each other. Because if they're not on the same, if they can't go to a digital channel that's shared, mm -hmm. they can't hear each other. There's no idea that was one of the problems there. If that was one of them for sure. So yeah, there's lots of issues. Oh, um, what do we want to do with the library? So we want to level funding like we, we've given in the past through 79, 250. Uh, this year, there, if I remember correctly, there were $9,000 over that figure. So it was around 388 or something. But actually, they came back with a revised budget and they are at 379. Oh, okay. Well, that's good. They answered that question. Just... But they are going to come back to you at some point for some deferred maintenance. Right? So I think that was sort of what they were laying the groundwork for. I remember the last time we did this, we, we approved the budget and they came back after the one and something different, but we stuck and, to our guns and said, sorry, we already adopted. And we're going to look system. into this further. So when we talk about our debt service, but I know Alyssa and I are looking at trying to figure out how many more years we have library payments, and it's pretty sub substantial on the current debt. It's, it's quite a ways. It's another 10, almost 50. like 32, I think. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a big, it's a big, right. Yeah. It's a, a long number. So yeah, I think we're gonna if there's no need additional maintenance work that needs to be done on the building, we really need to figure out how to spring it out, I think, carefully. I think you need an analysis like we did at the town. I mean a real analysis like that was done at the meeting house. It's the just, basic one. You really need to know. Yeah. Okay, I think I'll stop this for lack of time. <laughs> or the view of the time it is. Yeah. Uh, so we'll do those updates. We'll bring those back to you, and then we'll have the other piece. Do we have any orders? I don't see any votes. Um, I don't know. I did not grab any on the way down. Right. Let's uh, let's do financials. Yeah. I got some questions there. Too. Okay. What do you have to say? Yeah. All right. Go ahead. These are numbered, Peter. I was just going to say that. <laughs> I wanted to, want to get there first. Oh. <laughs> we'll have the other ones done, but the next time.
Well, well, I'll jump in while Peter's flipping through. The state civil fines, which is quite significant, 5,000 double, Where those are traffic stops? What are those? I believe most of that comes from the money that we go and ask them for twice a year. They do enough uh, accounting for that. And that's our portion of what the state police writes and other basic, anything that comes to the court system where we get a local piece of it. I think that's where most of that comes from. Yeah, and it's, yeah. it's traffic tickets and things like that. And often, right. it seems like we don't see that money ever. <laughs> so I, I just don't know if something has been, well, more follow-up is happening on that to make sure we get it. I know it's been filed for on a more regular basis. Okay. And, I, and I think that's also when we, when we um, revise our fire reimbursement for things like illegal burns, I believe that's also where that money should start coming as well. Because I think that's part of that BSA 24. Okay. Yeah, I mean, because I mean, when it does come down to whether we do have this town approval to hire out, right. um, we would get some, potentially get some of that money back. There's a piece that comes back, right? Um, as you would think they would be writing more tickets in the town that would then come down to us as opposed to incidental tickets that they just happen to catch someone in our town. Right. Okay, here we go. Uh, under revenue, I guess, uh, page two of 15 to 13. Recycling brown goods and CD is quite a ways up there for six. Six months in, the budget is 65 or 42 to 74, almost 43,000 right now. If that pace continues, we're going to be at 80 something <laughs> for revenue on that line out, which is good. Which means people are going on the um, scale. Mm -hmm. That's what that means. And, and uh, garbage disposal seems to be on target at 43%, a little low, but that's all right. Uh, the concern I have is the transfer of station permits. Very low. Yeah, that's a lot lower than that. So I, I, I guess we don't know if we're not checking. I guess I go get on put my policeman's hat on. I guess okay. down, stand down there. <laughs> the shutters menu grant, grant I looked at that, that's not there anymore. So don't worry about that. Yeah, I don't believe they're budget. extending that right. a third time. I think that one's done. Um, but they're doing actually pretty well. Everything with the with the um, theater revenue that's coming in—it's really that much money. It's forty-four thousand that came in, or is that um, no twenty thousand already? For special For revenue, page four of thirteen. Page four. Okay, hang on, let me get there. I was looking at the other page. That was not with the. Uh... The thing with the special event revenue is that a lot of that gets paid out on the expense okay. side. Yeah. Right, but still, I mean, when you add that in and then you add the yeah. expense, they kind of, right. they're, they're pretty balanced at this point. I mean, which is great. Well, and yeah, even if you take out the grant. Yeah, the, the, the hope is when we do more of these, especially like the Charlie, you know, they're, they're doing the um, concert series now and raise honor and a few other items so we should see more, more of those. Uh, Types of events too. The Brattleboro Select Board voted themselves a big raise. Six thousand bucks. Also, also, they're paying. Should I add that to the budget? Also, also that they're paying for child care for people too. It's like they got all these new benefits for Select Board members of Brattleboro. Very generous. Interesting. Interesting. <laughs> I, I do. Be satisfied this with little electric heater under the table. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. Oh, God. We don't ask, we don't ask for much. Look at me. That's what She's frozen. Yeah. I am it's bringing a What's, blanket. Uh, on page seven, what would the uh, uh, recycling expenses, materials, and supplies? God, it's 66000 What the hell are you spending on? I think 125 percent increase. So that's because Larry buys boots and sweatshirts or something. That's part of that. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so we have to, if that's going to be a, a regular allow, allow thing, we should update that line. Hmm. 
Well, it shouldn't be because once you get an allocation, since you're only doing three days a week, it's not like you're a full time guy where you're getting a uniform allowance. So, right. Yeah, it should not be. We'll have to have that. Okay. Page eight of 13. Remember the last month we moved that uh, 110, 10, 37, 50, 89 line up into the recycling expenses to get the true cost. But then yeah. the next line down, you show 110, 10, 37, 60, 45 for the same item. That's got zeros in it. Can we fix me that line? The line can't go away. It just, it'll sit there yeah, until next year. Oh, then okay. it'll go away. Yeah, all right. I, I just, just wonder what I know we moved it up to get the true cost because uh, uh, we never used to budget any money for that. Uh, useful solid waste disposal. That's why we always end up shooting the money down to down the food in our budget. So yeah. in the, uh, that's, that's why that loss is there, where we are. Um, county tax looks like it's going to stay the same. Hopefully. Uh, insurances, are we pretty much done with those, Alyssa? Because it's at 75, 78 percent. Coming on that, we have one more quarter to pay. We got one. I thought we were paying that half six months. No, mm -mm. okay. Okay. Other questions? We can yeah, go for it. Uh, page, uh, page five of 13, the $5,000 IRS penalty. Is that in the past? I see it's, it's under adjusted budget. Mm -hmm. What's that? What, what is that about? That was added in there because there was a lot of mistake with the um, W 2s. That were made, and we were pretty certain that we were going to get a fine from the government. Haven't seen a fine yet, so maybe we're good. You can release that. I, I yeah. Okay. Thank you for not making those kinds of mistakes. Now. Yeah. We didn't budget. We didn't budget they they forgive you for the first time because you keep doing it. They don't forgive me anymore. <laughs> okay. Anybody else got any questions on budget finance? We can let we can let Lisa off the book then. Yeah. Okay. Let's go on to the we can do the bills and orders or the bills and sector. Agenda items for the 2022 meeting. We got town moderator appointment that we didn't yes. take on this, but thank God it was because we only take this so like, yeah. We only have one applicant for today anyway. We have six. Oh, we don't want to. We advertise on the website and stuff. And stuff. I asked a couple of other people and I have never heard back from them. So, um, to be accepted. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, be accepted. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You, 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 you talked to Scott about but we need a formal you know, letter that he wanted to run. So, he, you know, send the village for some of your time. So. Anything else on the item for? Well, we should have the, I'll have the updated fire reimbursement ordinance that we talked about, adding a new section for production so that we can have some teeth in it, as well as we should have the radio grant on there as well. From, uh, we, need the, we need to also bring up the uh, amount of money for that fire study if we're going to do it. Uh, I spoke with them today, and I'm still waiting to hear if they're if the USDA is going to participate. So it's not a dead issue. Under that rural business development section, there is some possibility that they might fund some portion. So we might be okay. Moving back. So no, the building USDA. Is going to join. I to there's a community. The there's two that they already pulled money. Yeah, there's two yeah. sections, right? There's a community yeah. facility section, and then there's this rural business development. Well, under rural building. Some all over this. Under the rural business development section, they are reviewing the, the fire feasibility submission, and and I should hear from them shortly as to whether or not it's fundable under that section, including the Saxon River portion, which they're not eligible for under community facilities. Okay, but that did so go so on that. So it's still not dead yet. Okay. Yes. 
And if, right, if right. they do amount, if they do grant it, then we'll have it on for the twentieth. Obviously, we we'll want to get it approved and get it started. Okay. I know that everybody will take to get that going. So yeah. just uh, yes, very. Okay. Uh, agenda items for the drug board, January thirtieth. Exactly. We got time. Yeah, I was gonna say I'm not. not that Should we talk in. about policing? It'll be too late to put it in in our budget. I think we just have to go with yeah. putting it to the town for a vote. Yeah. Well, as I say, but little place all over and go from there. Because I mean, when you start can... having the policing budget, then you have the fire department budget, yeah. moving, and then you have the towns oh, moving. Yeah. And we go through this cycle every 10 yeah, years or five right. years and it gets shot down. So yeah. it's it's an endless loop. So. Yeah. Oh. Okay, other business. Uh start with the correct nothing. So um no. Uh, the only thing I have is the con report items uh was requested that December 15th was a drop dead date for like a report of the select board, which I'll be working on this week. Anybody else that has reports, any committees or anything else that wants to have a report in there, just okay. to get it to the lady over there with the bum leg. Yeah. Exact assist. <laughs> You're the at rock me up. <laughs> I'm not the title, that's the email. <laughs> You're in charge of that. She's well, saying, I'm in. Well, listen, yeah. Okay. Why do you have anything? Hey, there's no need for executive session. Shall I get a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. 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 Second.